welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. I'm going to share my screen here. We're going to get started. We've got obviously a bit to get through, but um, again, thank you all for attending. Uh, this is our second Public Works GI Solutions virtual showcase. We did one back in May. It was very well attended. A um, lot of good feedback. People really and really enjoyed it. Um, it was just a just a very fun, uh, cool time. I got to move my. Hold on. All right. Um, so yeah, a um, lot of lot of good interaction um, with everybody. Um, the breakout rooms were a big hit, so we're, do, we're definitely going to do that again. Um, but just a just a really good time, and and um, like I said, a lot of good feedback. People really enjoyed it, really learned a lot. So um, so let's get started. So Cloud Point Engineering Spatial Public Works GI Solutions Virtual Showcase. Uh, so today, oh, oh, come on. So, all right, so today I sent you guys the agenda. Um, again, if you if you don't have it or couldn't get it, um, just message me, I'll make sure that you guys have that. But I think it was in your invite that went out for this. So, um, but the big thing, um, you know, since we can't really meet in person, um, like at all really right now, um, just putting some names to faces. Um, I know there's a number of people just personally for myself, I've seen your names over and over and maybe I have seen you uh, in a webinar or, uh, maybe the last showcase or something like this, but never actually met you in person. So it's nice to nice to be able to do that with everybody, really. Um, obviously, a little networking time. We've been chatting here in the morning, so we appreciate that. Thanks for taking my my silly poll. Um, keep your eyes out. You might see another one later. Um, obviously, we want you guys to learn something. Um, that's what we're here. We're, we're big believers in, in sharing um, and um, just growing together. Um, you know, not we're not just in it. Uh, just for the business um, that does help, but um, we're definitely here to share our knowledge and um, and learn from you guys as well. If you if you have stuff that relates to us, um, relates to what we're talking about as well, um, and then professional development hours, I'll be sending for everyone that attends. I'll be sending you guys a little certificate. Um, so if that's applicable to you guys, um, again, just kind of as added little uh, little piece um, for you guys to take home with you. So I'll be sending that out after, um, and then just a break from the norm you know, whatever your norm is. Um, some of us are in the office. Um, some of us are in the office sometimes. Some of us are completely at home still. Um, but whatever your norm is, um, we're just trying to trying to break it up a little bit and give you guys, you know, something a little, a little different to do, a little, a little different to, to see. So who are we? CloudPoint Geospatial. Uh, we're a professional services provider, uh, data collection, GIS services, we're not a software vendor. We're not giving you something out of a box. Uh, obviously, we we definitely consider ourselves mapping technology experts, web-based maps and apps, and we're a trusted Esri business partner. Um, we've got our uh, recently got our ArcGIS indoor specialty, but also our release-ready specialty, our AGO ArcGIS online specialty, and ArcGIS for local government specialty through Esri. <clears throat> Speakers today, we've got Mitchell Winicky, Solution Engineer from Esri. Um, he's going to be going over um, the cover, uh, solutions for public works. Um, he comes from Esri. Uh, you can a little bio up there. Um, I like the uh, the fun fact there. Summited Denali on July 4th during a solo expedition that took 21 days. Um, I don't I, I don't want to know what you ate. Uh, during that, because I'm sure it was hockey pucks of protein and carbs. Um, Anything but, and everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, he, we're glad to have him back. He was at our first one. Again, if you, if anybody was here, he, he presented at our first showcase. Um, and uh, we thank him for coming back and, and presenting again. Thank you. Uh, after that, next up is going to be Hunter, Hunter Ray. Uh, Hunter is new here at CloudPoint. Um, not new to the GIS world, but new with us. Started back in July. Yes, July. Yes, thank you, Hunter. Um, comes from Springfield, so he's kind of a local, local Central Illinois guy. Um, worked with uh, the USDA uh, for quite a while, um, but then uh, really was heavy into their helping with GIS and everything, and so uh, transitioned over to here. And he's he's really uh, just in the past couple of months, he's really become a good good part of the team here. So we're happy to have him and. This will be his first showcase, first presentation, so we're excited to see that as well. Um, he'll be going over Hub, ArcGIS Hub, 
and uh, just how you guys uh, can use that within your organization to you know engage with the public. So that'll be a really cool thing for, especially for anybody that hasn't seen it. Um, after that, well, we'll have a breakout session in between there, a little bit of a break, and I'll, I'll go over that here in a minute. But then after the breakout session, we'll come back in and Micah uh, will join us. He'll be talking all about field mobility and going over uh, field apps from Esri. Um, that's a really good presentation, uh, especially related to public, public works. A lot of good feedback on that one last time. And then after Micah, uh, Mike Gennard, another one of our GIS techs here at CloudPoint, he is going to be go over our infrastructure assets dashboards. So dashboards, very important, very uh, key, and very helpful to public works departments. So he will be going over that very good presentation. And then to wrap things up, Matt Yunker, um, he's going to actually be taking over for John. John uh, wasn't able to be here this week, so uh, Matt's going to take over for John and go through his presentation on migrating to electronic inspection forms. Uh, so Matt's been with us for uh, quite a while, and uh, another one of our GIS professionals here at CloudPoint does a lot of our land records and parcel fabric and uh, managed services for a couple couple governments close by, but um, he'll be doing that electronic inspection form presentation. Uh, so like I said, to break things up in the middle, we're going to have breakout rooms. So again, if you did attend last time, um, or obviously you've probably been on uh, uh, presentations or conferences with Zoom, they have the Zoom rooms. So when it comes to that time, I'll be breaking you guys out into small groups. Um, we'll, we'll have the presenters, we'll all be moderators within those rooms, just kind of facilitate the talk and I'll be, uh, we'll, we'll have a couple kind of canned questions to just kind of start the conversation, but, um, we'll give, give, give you guys a good, you know, 20, 30 minutes to, to go through that just to get some small group interaction. So that'll be nice. Um, and then obviously we'll have a break, hit the restroom, get some more coffee, water, whatever you need. Um, and just like last time, I will be pulling names from a hat. So anybody that's in attendance at that time, I'm going to take all these names out of the uh, participant list and draw names from a hat. And you could get some Cloud Point swag mailed to you. Yes, very exciting. Hold your <laughs> applause, please. All right, and like I said before, uh, we use Zoom for everything that we do here. Um, so we want you to interact, obviously, but please, um, please stay muted during the presentations. Um, the camera, same thing there. Um, we'd like, you know, we'd like to see your faces. If you want to feel comfortable having a camera on, that's great. If not, that's totally fine. It's your choice. Um, it will definitely be helpful more in the small breakout sessions um, to have those on just to really have some good interaction there. Um, and then gallery view, if you haven't used Zoom much, gallery view versus speaker view. When we're all in the room, uh, when someone's not sharing their screen, um, gallery view is nice because you can kind of see everybody. Speaker view, it's going to pop up whoever's talking, you know, nice and big. So, again, just uh, so you know, you have those options. That's up in the I think top right corner um, of your screen. Should be able to do that. And then the chat room, uh, we're definitely we're going to rely heavily on the chat room. So we're going to use the chat room. Uh, you can chat with other attendees in there. You can chat with any of the uh, presenters. Um, in there, we should all be up at the top. You see us labeled as co-hosts there. Uh, myself, I'm I'm under the CloudPoint host name. Um, so if anything goes on, you need you know you can chat with us. But then we'll also be using that for questions. So during anytime during the presentation, feel free to put a question in the chat box. Um, I will make sure and keep track of those. If it's something that um, someone another co-host can answer at that time, we'll. Uh, maybe try to jump in there, but we'll we'll save some time at the end of every presentation to try to get some to some questions. And if there's things that we can't get to, we'll hold on to those. Um, I'll make sure and save save all those questions, everything, and we'll try to get back to you at, at a different time or or uh, later in the showcase. Um, but but make sure and use that chat room um, for ch for talking with us and co-hosts and, and submitting your questions. Uh, obviously, be respectful and uh, have patience too. So uh, I think last time went pretty well and. Most times everything flows pretty well, but at the same time, um, you know, something uh, messes up a little bit in our presentation, just have a little patience with us, with me. It's mostly me. <laughs> and that's our contact screen. That's actually for the end. So I am going to stop sharing. And our first presenter is Mitch. So Mitch, you should 
be able to share, you should be able to have everything working for you. So if you want to pull up your presentation, we'll get started here on solutions. Perfect. Where are we at? Mute. Can you unmute yourself, Mitch, or do I need to? There we go. I think I'm unmuted go. now. Awesome. Gotcha. Okay. You see my screen okay? Yep. Looks great. Patterns, trends, solutions. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks for the wonderful introduction, and thanks to CloudPoint for having me. I'm super excited about this. This is something I'm really passionate about. Like Bill mentioned, um, I'm here and I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I've got a wide range of GIS experience all the way from cadastral survey team in Alaska um, to being actual program back end and front end work here in Minneapolis and the wide application of sciences. And, and as you can see, living in Minnesota makes it very easy to be a sportsman. So those are kind of my hobbies. And so now you know a little bit about me. So what we're going to do here is just talk about some, some, the first, it's going to, I basically divvied up into two halves. Um, first, is, yep. and then the second half will be on more uh, public works focused. So give me a second here. We have a bit of a delayed response. There we go. So the first thing I want to talk to you about today is GeoNet. So this is basically, it's a way in which our solutions team can organize their work. So there's basically, if, if you find something wrong with our software, et cetera, and you're probably not the only one, there's two ways to submit that as a problem. One is through tech support. The other is through GeoNet. Now, what I love about GeoNet here is if you haven't used it before, it's a great receptacle for information, but also we've got developers and the like commenting directly on it. But the best part about it is um, you can up like a comment. So if someone has a problem with it, um, say going back to uh, model builder to Python script, that functionality wasn't in ArcGIS Pro for a long time and people got really fed up and there was like a 10,000 uplikes on it. And literally the developers are like, hey, we need to move this to ahead of our work schedule. So that's a way that you can influence uh, how Esri kind of takes care of business. So that's kind of cool. Meetups, I just want to touch on this real quick. If you're not a part of this, you totally should be. It's uh, monthly or by month, uh, every other month. Uh, Meetup, just Google ArcGIS solutions for local government, and it'll you'll get on a meeting invite list, and it'll send you a calendar update um, for these events. It'll put it on your calendar events. They're they're a great way to stay informed. And the early adopter community, I just wanted to mention that real quick because I'm, I'm going to mention it later on when I talk about field maps. But the important thing is, is I get this question a lot that customers ask, Mitch. I want to be on like the razor's edge of Esri. Like I want to know what's going on and I want to be a part of it. The early adopter community is for you. So one of the, we have this <clears throat> group within Esri, you know, like any other software company, we have, we've got professional services, we've got sales, you know, we've got the tech support, but kind of like this unsung group is the called the patterns and practices. And basically what they do is they just study how our industry, so we, I work specifically in government, they study how government uses GIS. And they've divided that up into nine patterns of use that you see right here. And that basically all use of GIS follows one of these patterns. And then what we do is we create industry solutions on top of that. So the idea is, is that we're building these pre-baked solutions that are just kind of ready and waiting for your data because everyone has parcels, everyone has hydrants, everyone has utilities in the ground. So it's very easy to build software around that, that to, to do different things. All right, now this is going to be, I'm going to quickly mention this, this is going to be a little bit more focused for the GIS people in the room. So anyone that is considers themselves a full-time GIS person is our, our, our field op, field operations and field maps. So this is how Esri visualizes how field operations generally work. And when we break this down into a usable format, so, so pay attention here as I flip through the slide, we break it down, those patterns, into different applications that take care of each stage of that work function. 
Now, the important thing to remember here is that it's going to be a best of breed solutions between all the solutions that you see right here. Now working top to bottom, the first is Explorer for mapping. We have Collector for collecting data. Uh, the next one's Navigator. We have Workforce is the red one. And then uh, bottom one is Tracker. Now all of these applications are gonna be into some, move into a, 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 a common platform that we're gonna call Field Maps, okay? Another important thing to remember here, now we're gonna follow this, we, this is the cyclical pattern of work that we see again. And I'm gonna draw your attention to the lower side of the screen where we have Survey123 and ArcGIS Quick Capture. Important thing to take home message is for, with those applications will remain separate. So you do not, they will remain entirely separate applications supported separately. Everything else that you see here, going back to this slide, will roll into field maps. This is all happening quickly. We came up with a beta program uh, earlier on this year, so some of you might have been a part of that. Um, there is a QR code right there, so if you wanted to go ahead and scan that right now, you can, but you just kind of see a snapshot of the release schedule coming up. Um, so don't get too concerned about this if you do have uh, collector applications and things like that, because they'll be supported for quite some time now. So what I want to touch on real quick, Survey123, if you're, if you're using our mobile solutions, that's great. If you're not, you totally should be. <laughs> so I get this question a lot, Mitch, when should I be using survey one, two, three. And so the question is right there is, are you trying to replace paper forms? If the answer to that is yes, then the application is likely going to be survey one, two, three. Quick Capture is an awesome new application that came out this year. This is what we call our big button mobile app. And is this is by far the simplest way to capture field, op, field data. So looking at the screen on our right hand side, all of these, uh, observed hazards, we have animal hazard, flood hazard, occupants, so on and so forth, look like this is used for urban search and rescue. We can make those buttons look and say anything we want. We can tie them to data that you have existing. So we're updating data on the fly. We can, when we take a picture, we can route that into workforce in the field apps um, to allow you to create, take a picture of a problem and create a work order on demand. So it's very cool and it's made for at speed data collection, very rapid, very quick data collection. And operations dashboard has just finally, like two years ago, they finally blew up. Um, it's been a great technology forever, but now it seems like people are really um, seeing the power of dashboards. Some of you might've seen, if you watch the news, when the COVID thing bro broke out, they had the Johns Hopkins dashboard. That's, that's an ArcGIS dashboard. So that's our technology. So Everyone on this call could build one of those dashboards because it's free data sitting out there. Operations dashboard is where you're gonna be plugging in all this. So if you've got collector apps sitting out there, you've got workforce things, you've got uh, a public comment section where people can report problems and stuff like that. You can plug that into an operations dashboard and control it, ask questions of the data, create external views for public transparency and create internal views for, for more uh, in-depth analysis. App builders, I just wanted to touch on real quick because it's super important. We basically, if you're not using these two app builders, you should be because we, Esri, like I said, long ago, we basically took the programming out of all of this. So you don't need to be a programmer to build sweet app uh, web applications. And there's basically two ways to do it in the, in, the, in the ArcGIS atmosphere. One is the web app builder on the left. Uh, the other is the experience builder on the right. Just for clarification, they will remain, Esri's current trajectory with these products is to, for them to remain separate um, and they will be run in parallel. And then professional development, Got to stay on top of it. It's so important. Um, and the the take home message with this is, if if you if you're not using the the all of the online tools that Esri has um, for for education and things like that, you should be. 
that's how I learn different skills to do my job. So there's no secret recipe that I deal with. It's, 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 I have the same resources that, that everyone on this call does. So there's a lot of information out there. Esri's, uh, um, catalog for sub, uh, subscription paying customers is absolutely immense. Um, and please check that out. I just want to touch on this real quick because we need to make a differentiator. Uh, I spent some time with Jack last year, Jack Dangerman, the CEO of our company, a really bright, interesting man. Um, he really spent a lot of time on this because we should be you should be challenging yourself and I'm going to challenge everyone on this call here. Do, are you using your GIS for location intelligence? Are you using it for now looking at the bottom of this? Are you using it for planning and design? Are you using your GIS for decision-making? Are you using your GIS to create action in your organization? At that point, you have a location intelligence on the top. You just have a GIS. Now making, it's a very, very important distinction between the two because this is a technology that can be transformative to your organization and totally should be. So with that, we're going to do a little bit more switch gears here. I just quickly wanted to touch on that stuff because it's really important. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in patterns and trends. I'm just going to take a quick break here uh, for about a minute and let you kind of peruse through uh, this article and specifically the, the one on the bottom, the lower half. And the one that really stuck out to me was on the bottom here, this one, as the, oops, as the United States infrastructure age, ages and funding measures are often unable to keep up, the search for a solution has led many to consider preservation instead of building new. Because of this, many public agencies are shifting their focus and funding to preserving their infrastructure. And I'm sure many of you people are, are on this call are already following that trend, but it's, it's, very, it's very interesting to follow these trends. Now, so specifically what ArcGIS, we've got an entire sector of our business dedicated to public works. We can help you maintain authoritative inventory of your assets in the field, anything, any asset, we consider everything as an asset. Analyze the effective aging of infrastructure, infrastructure age reports for all of your underground utilities, everything like that. You should be doing all sorts. There's tons of infrastructure age reports that we can do for all sorts of your assets. Capital improvement projects, broadcasting a lot of this information to the public is, is a big deal now. Uh, defending your argument for more funding, uh, not only through public awareness, but you know, creating data products that help explain your story that you can present to your higher ups as well. And, and obviously a number of other things that GIS is known for, right? Reducing cost of field operations and maintenance activities, improve operational awareness and response, improve customer service, transparency, accountability. And once again, we do this by following the nine patterns of use. So once again, we follow these nine patterns of use. We find out how public works or, and engineering organizations are using our software or how they're using GIS. And then we create solutions to, to satiate those needs. Now this is <clears throat> just a snapshot of the public works uh, pre-built applications that we have. There are many other out there. This is just kind of a snapshot of what we have. So what I'm gonna do here is right now, I'm just gonna jump into a very quick demonstration at this point. And you're still seeing my screen here. We should be viewing the solutions gallery. Yep, looks good. All right, great, thank you. So I always start with the solutions page here. Um, it's, all, it's all separated out into industry. So I'm just gonna hop onto local government. And as you can see, we're just gonna jump into public works right here. And then we have an idea of some of the pre-built applications. Any one of these I can jump into and I can just test them out so that this is a view direct. Um, view application. And then also what I like to do, we also have a gallery page. So I can just type in something like right of way. And now look at all of these right away applications we have from reviewers and internal um, analysis 
to public dashboards and permit applications, all pre-built for right-of-ways. Another one I always jump into because I always I, 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 I help the city of Shawnee kind of build this. So this is a part of their open data hub page and it's at the city of Shawnee, Kansas. They're only responsible for pavement management and stormwater management. So the idea is we created a, a separate home page for this. It was a, a hub page. And then the idea was to create a dashboard like this where you can see every bit condition ratings for every lane mile of pavement that they have within the entire city. Now, moreover, these, all this data you see right here is tied to collector applications. So when they're doing operations in the field, you know, it's feasible that I could refresh this browser and we could see numbers change because they're live. Most importantly, for those of you on the line that, uh, are looking or have heard of an asset management system, the data that you see right here lives in a separate database, in a CityWorks database, asset management system. We're just viewing the data in an ArcGIS online dashboard. So very cool. And same thing with uh, stormwater management. I mean, look at how comprehensive this is. We've just got all sorts of information for pipe inspections. Very cool. And the last one I want to show you right here is City of Topeka open for performance page. What they did is on the main page, they took uh, all, set, uh, all six of their strategic goals within their city and they created a separate page for them. So they say, you know, how does Topeka invest in infrastructure? Well, we've got major streets under construction here. We've got, we could link right here to a capital improvement dashboard, but I won't for sake of brevity public meetings, more stuff on, uh, we've got condition pave, uh, pavement condition index, potholes. And I'll stop right there, cracks sealed by linear feet. I'll just stop right there, um, but I'll just draw your attention to the right-hand side of the screen. We're about a third of the way down this page. And I think it's important to highlight, you know, coming, I've, I've worked in government from federal all the way down to city at every level. And in my opinion, it's such, from the public's perspective, it's such a what have, what have you done for me today kind of attitude. I like, I can look at this page. It's what have you done for me today? I, look, it's all here. So I just think that's super cool. All right. Coming back to the PowerPoint. You still see my PowerPoint here? Looks good. So moving on, I just, there's a few other things I just want to touch up uh, as we conclude um, the idea of uh, real-time capabilities. Now, real-time can be a number of different things, but in the Esri atmosphere, the premier way to do it is through Geo Event Server. And we can basically tap into anything that provides a live feed and then do something with it. So I put my own text in here for those of you that have taken a programming class. That's the idea with GeoVent is that we can have a, a we can tap into a live feed and we can analyze that data with filters on the fly. We can have processors, we can have event handlers, we can have listeners. So if this happens, do this and then do this and then do this and then notify, send an email to Bill and you know send me a text. That's the idea behind real time GIS. It's a story of integration. We can track, manage, and monitor assets in real time and gain awareness. Now this, don't let this fool you. It's not, doesn't have to be specifically a truck. It's not limited to things like snow plows. Think any type of sensors. We've been in, in big cities. I helped the city of St. Louis. They wanted to set up, they wanted funding for a uh, compressed natural gas um, garbage trucks. And so we set up sensors that the week, so we could do microclimating within the city so that they could say, yeah, when, when the temperature is above 90 degrees at this part of town, the, the, the atmosphere is literally toxic and we have data to prove it. Civic engagement is, is a, the, one of the biggest aspects of all of the, uh, the ideas that we should be thinking. Um, we do this through ArcGIS Hub. This is Open Data Hub. This is how we broadcast all of our information. And within that hub, we have the solutions that people can go to. If you, if you, there's also story maps that, uh, that really help tell the story of your organization and what you're trying to do. 
So key takeaways for this, um, pre-built applications. 90% pre-built, you configure the last 10%. Very important distinction there because gone are the days when we would, when we would customize things. We don't customize anything anymore. We configure it. That way when we update our software, all our configurations are still there. Real-time capabilities operate, uh, have the, uh, they have the ability to improve decision-making, analyze streams of data, create patterns, uh, and that's not limited to GeoEvent server. ArcGIS field apps and things like that can track people with their cell phone, right? So if we wanted to track crews, things like that, we can do that via GPS as well. And then last but not least, the collection of citizen engagement solutions uh, enable your organization to tell the story, improve transparency, and, and more effectively engage with the citizens. So thanks so much. I'll be on the line here, so I'll be uh, in the breakout room. Um, I left my email address in there, so feel free to take that down. I'm a full-time GIS nerd, so uh, <laughs> feel free to uh, ask me any type of GIS-related question. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Guys, if you have any questions, we are definitely ahead of schedule, which is okay. Um, so if any questions for Mitch uh, going over his presentation, go ahead and drop those in the chat room now, and we will get to those while we're waiting here. Let's see. Up next, we've got Hunter with his hub. So Hunter, we'll give, we'll give people a couple minutes here if we need to take any questions um, but if you want to start getting your stuff ready yeah I can get ready <laughs> yeah any questions for me we can do a quick Q&A if you like yep nothing nothing popping up now but guys feel free mm -hmm. we can answer those live or we can just type chat and answer back to you no problem you know, while we're waiting for a question here, oh, what is the difference between hub and sites? Uh, okay, good, great question, great question. So think of hub, hub is like the receptacle for it, right? You have a, a primary hub site. And, and off of that, we can build a, a site or a page. We're using site and page interchangeably. You can build a, a site for public works. I can build a site for the assessor. I can build a site for so on and so forth, a different department, uh, an initiative that we're trying to do. We can build a site for that. And a site will live within the hub page, a primary hub page. Does that, does that make sense? I wanna just, if that doesn't make sense, we can, I can continue to go over it. Got another one here for you, Mitch. Uh, will filled maps replace all the individual apps? Yep, yep. So they, they're gonna replace all of the individual apps that uh, um, I can go back to my screen here if we like for clarification. Yep, absolutely, we got plenty of time. Sure, cool. Um, share, share, share. Let me know. Yep. Okay, cool. So the, all of the applications that you see here, right? So top to bottom, Explorer, Collector in blue, Navigator, Workforce in red, and the bottom one, Tracker. All of these will move into field apps with added capabilities. So that's that was kind of the idea behind this is that all of these applications are so heavily used for the cyclical pattern of, of defined work that we've seen in the industry that it's, it's going to be easier to add it, them all into one programming platform where, where we can add a, just a ton more capability to it. And the important thing with that is Survey123 and Quick Capture will be excluded from that. So they will remain on their own separate development platform. And then just as a follow-up, is there a sunset date announced for those or will, will there be, do you know um, any dates for that? I don't know. I know that it's releasing quickly, um, but my personal opinion with, with 
and those of you in the this is my personal opinion and those of you that have been in the GIS game a long time is that I with a lot of this stuff with Esri I'm I'm not the first to move to it you know when 10.8 comes out I'm going to wait till 10.8.1 comes out and that's just my personal experience that's just the type of person I am um so I I would be exploring the capabilities but I wouldn't be in an immediate rush to move to them now, if you had a larger scale plan for a large scale uh, new, like if you're doing some new things with Collector, and we've got a larger project going on, I might want to look to use field apps as my go forward strategy for that moving forward, right? But anything you have existing, you know, like I'd, I'd probably just leave that for now. Mitch, can I want to, if I can step in just for a second, mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree with absolutely everything you're saying. Um, uh, we've even had conversations previous to this about field maps and whether or not we would talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Right now, the beta, it looks like collector. If you, if you get into the beta program, and there's a reason we can't show it because it's in beta. Um, but if you get into the beta program and you do go through all the steps to, to look at it, um, it looks like ArcGIS Collector right now. Yep. Uh, that's because that's the, it's beta one, and they start with a with with something. I, I'm not saying they started with Collector. I don't know how the how the development works, but um, if you would open it up and it's like this is it has a new branding, but it's Collector. That's because that's where the beginning. They want to get that yep. into it and then be able to kind of work from there because that is by far the most popular app. So. We'll talk yeah, a little bit more about those individual apps, but yeah, I, I kind of concur. And I've actually said that very same thing. I usually wait to the point one version yep. for rolling out. Um, so anyway. So I can, t I can tell you've been in the game a while. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Perfect. Well, that's great guys. Um, if anybody has anything else for Mitch, um, obviously you can get in touch with him directly, um, whether it's through the chat room here in the showcase, um, like you said, he's, he left his email up there as well. Um, you guys get in touch with him directly. Um, but, uh, Mitch, thanks so much. And he's going to stick around to help yep. moderate a room. So you might get in a room with him. You can bend his ear a little bit more. So, um, Hunter, we're just going to go ahead and move right along. And if you're ready to go. Yeah, let's do it. Should, be able, to, should be able to share over Mitch's. Yeah, uh, let's see. I guess I'll share mine and then. Perfect. All right. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, let me switch this. All right. So uh, tough to follow up, Mitch. She covered a lot, and Bunny actually segued into Hub, so this is good. Uh, so I'm Hunter. I'm new here, and we'll be going over RPS Hub and kind of what it is and how it works and. Just kind of give you guys a, a background into it and maybe uh, give you some ideas on what you can do for your organization. So uh, I'd like to start with one-liners when I give a presentation of kind of like what we're going over. And uh, the first one here is what I got from Esri. And Hub is an easy to configure cloud platform that organizes people, data, and tools to accomplish initiatives and goals. And um, kind of revolves around data collection and your GIS services. But then as I got into using it and building some test sites uh, for this presentation, I kind of came up with my own. That's, you know, it's basically just low code web design. Uh, it's a platform that's centered around your organization's GIS data and mostly your applications. And, you know, it's really there for building engagement with both internal and external stakeholders and kind of like to sum it all up, it's this cool electronic bridge because, you know, we all have data that's in our organization and you have maybe internal or uh, particularly external stakeholders, people in your city or your county that you want to interact with. And a hub site is a perfect bridge to kind of put those two things together. So uh, I wanted to touch on the two. There's two different types of hub. A basic is what we all get with uh, ArcGIS Online. So if you uh, have an ArcGIS Online set up for your organization, then you have Hub and you have the basic version. 
uh, and there's a lot that you can do with the basic version. Uh, the main thing is you can have unlimited individual pages. So you can have as many single page initiatives that you want to set up. Um, and there's also some single page templates that come with basic. So if you don't want to start from scratch, you can look at what other people have, have done and what Esri has set up and kind of use those to get started if you have an idea. Um, and one thing that I wanted to touch on that I kind of figured out while I was getting into it was I was kind of questioning how do I have this library of ArcGIS online content and how does that work with this you know, interaction with the public? Well, what they've set up is this kind of like intermediate library that is tied to your individual page. So you go into the page that you're building and you set up a content library that's specific to the page. So you can look through your, uh, all of your data in ArcGIS online and you can select items to be brought into the individual page uh, library for people to see and interact with. Um, another thing in basic, you get what they call a core team, which is basically just an ArcGIS online group that's made whenever you create a site. And you can add users in your organization to that group and allow them to help collaborate and, and develop your site. And um, you can integrate Server123 uh, forms. Uh, dashboards and web applications all inside of your hub. So they can be uh, not just links, but you can have them actually be running embedded in, in the site. Um, and then there's some sharing controls that you can set up like anything. Uh, a hub site is kind of like uh, another piece of content in your organization. If you log into ArcGIS online, it has sharing controls like anything else where they can be set to private, group shared, or uh, totally public. So, um, and then with premium, this is a, a, a thing you would have to uh, pay for extra, but you get all the basic options, which is really uh, all you really need to get started, I think, for anybody that's going to make the first site. And then uh, you get these unlimited multi-page initiatives. So you can have, like, instead of just one single page, you can have these uh, tabs, like what we've seen in some of Mitch's examples where one page is linked to all these other pages for different things. So um, that's kind of cool. And I'll show some cool examples of those. And then uh, you get access to not only the basic single page templates, but some multi-page initiative templates. And what's really cool with premium is that you could have multiple teams with custom collaboration roles and content sharing. So instead of just one core team, which is what you get with basic, you can set up multiple teams, maybe you have some people that are your design people and they just only need to be able to help uh, publish a draft of your page and they're only kind of making sure everything works good and the user interface is good. Or maybe you have some people that are actually working with the data and bringing that in and customizing data in ArcGIS Online or your, your items and making them really kind of geared towards uh, what you want the, the site to, or the or your initiative to be about. And then, uh, the last thing with premium that's pretty cool if you had a really big initiative you're, you're setting off is that you can have external users. So people that are outside of uh, your ArcGIS online um, organization, you know, you don't have users for people like maybe there's some students who are doing something with a, a school project or um, maybe another organization that's, you know, doesn't have ArcGIS online or they're not in your ArcGIS online. You can add those people just uh, with an email and, kind of give them a user and then you can set them in a, a one of the multiple groups or teams that you can set up and kind of give them some different uh, roles and privileges to your site. You know, so like one thing, maybe you have an external uh, uh, web page design group that you use. You have somebody that uh, you want to help collaborate with the design of the page. That person could be an external user, bring them in, give them certain roles. Maybe you you want them to be able to design the site, but not actually send the publish to the public facing side. So uh, that's just kind of a cool example of what you can do with premium and the external users. So uh, the biggest question I had was like, how do I get started, right? So we all have uh, the capabilities to build a basic hub site. Uh, and the first thing that I, I kind of learned as I went through creating one myself was that uh, you may need to go into your ArcGIS online content and create and or modify the content itself that you want to share. So 
likely uh, your organization, if you have ArcGIS Online, has some web apps or maps or maybe some Survey123 forms that are in, and in your uh, content library and are set to public and you're sharing those with people or maybe some internal staff. But when you start putting together the website or the hub site, you may realize that um, maybe I need to change something or modify the content and uh, you know, you, maybe you didn't initially create it for uh, a public facing uh, application that was going to be used. So um, we were looking at uh, one of our um, uh, ArcGIS online organizations and saw that, you know, everything was actually really nice and set up to be public. So we went ahead and used that, but I could see how uh, looking at other organizations, you may need to modify some stuff. And really for kind of the, the idea we're going for here today is a public hub site. So um, you need to set the sharing uh, of items to be public. So, um, and that kind of goes back to the first bullet. Maybe you, you need to modify some things. They were set to be internal and then you kind of want to uh, open them up to be shared via this hub site. You may need to modify and, and set the sharing to be public. But really uh, from there, once you kind of get a look at your background data that you want to use, then you just go to ArcGIS Online and open up uh, a new hub site and, and start designing away. So um, I have some live examples and just to kind of get started, I wanted to show uh, a really cool example that I found that was uh, DC has this really cool open data site and uh, but it's kind of geared around uh, the hub development and you know, this is your typical uh, multi-page uh, hub site that you can have. And they've got all these, a gallery of items and things linked in here, uh, pieces of dashboards and, you know, this, the main page here. And this is kind of similar to what Mitch showed us earlier. But um, you can tell that they've used uh, pieces of hub and, and kind of set this up to, uh, be a really good example of, of what you can do with Hub if you kind of dive in and really spend some time on it. But uh, so they have these data stories, which was kind of cool. I got looking into these and uh, there was this a plethora of, of things that you can use uh, to dive into to data about DC, but uh, they kind of had this cool link to a story that was no tree left behind. So it's just kind of this story map, but um, it just shows how easily you can get people to kind of walk through your site and, and see all of maybe the different initiatives and things that your organization is doing that may otherwise be left unnoticed. So this kind of goes through and has, you know, all these little things, but one of the coolest things is this how they have this web map in here where maybe you want to go in and, and find a tree to plant. So um, it was just kind of a cool example of like maybe what the end goal of a really nice premium hub site would be. And then there's Douglas County. They, I just kind of like the layout and they have um, one of my favorite things here is the, they have their maps and apps like really set up nicely. And so these were kind of the workflows I was using to try to find inspiration to build my first site. And I think for those of you that end up wanting to maybe give this a try, the, the best thing you can do is first go out and, and look at what some other people have done to kind of try to conceptualize what you want to do before you get started. But, you know, they have just all kinds of stuff. And, and again, this kind of ties into um, creating and modifying your data. So um, start thinking about how you would group your data. If it's not already grouped, you know, some things are put in there haphazardly. They're not all tagged correctly and put in nice, tidy groups in ArcGIS Online. So looking at some of these examples of these uh, well-developed sites kind of gives you an idea of like, well, maybe I need to start modifying and, and grouping my data a little differently so that it works well and blends into this nice hub site. But um, to get started, and that's kind of where we left off, um, how easy is it to get started? Well, here's the city of Pekin. So we, this was um, the organization I used to create a test site. They have a lot of really nice public facing web applications that are made to be shared and kind of provide the public engagement and the public data sharing that is really what Hub is all about. So if you uh, are in your ArcGIS Online organization, you can just go into uh, the app selector 
and click hub and here you are you are ready to get started so you see there's a couple sites here this is the one that i put together for today just a kind of uh, example of what i was able to do in a relatively short amount of time and kind of throw things together but um, if you want to go in and start a new site you can just click new and here's where you can browse some templates or just create the basic bootstrap site you know it just kind of gives you the layout and you can modify from there and give it a name but you'll see in here there's some templates of maybe like a specific project site and these are the initiatives that i was talking about um, if you had a real directive that you wanted to share some data to but um, for just kind of starting out, I think uh, starting just a basic site. So we could give it like, uh, we'll call it the webinar test site, call it whatever you want. Um, and then within a few seconds, it's already made us a nice template to start with. And it's got the splash screen saying, hey, here's how you get started, customize your theme and branding, add in some lay, you know, layout items, um, Maybe you want to use the dashboard to track some metrics. There's teams. So now if you go back in ArcGIS Online, you'll see there's a core team uh, created around the site name. So it would be you know, around webinar test. And you can add people to that to help collaborate. And then you can add, you know, it's already saying like, hey, integrate some server one, two, three forms for feedback. You know, maybe it's just a form you make about your site. Do you like it? What would you like to see change? What would you like to see added? That is totally doable and easy to do with these hub sites. And then the content library. So it, that's kind of where we'll start just to show you this is like the crux of getting a site going. Um, you can create new content, but for most of us, you just want to go into your ArcGIS online organization and look at all of the data. So you can see there's 175 items in here. But um, if I'm going to make a public app, how do I get started? How do I filter that down? Well, in the sidebar here, you can look at the sharing levels and maybe just to get started, you want to start with anything that's public. So now we have all of these items that are public and we want to start with maybe sharing some web apps and add those to our content library for the site. So if you're in the apps and maps and then you can go to uh, maybe web apps and you can click these and have them added to, um, you know, let's start with maybe the Enterprise Zone web app and uh, Garbage Pickup by Day. And hit select, and now you're going to see that your content library, which is the library for the site, now has a few items in it. So um, this is just quickly and easily a way to kind of get things set up and make them accessible. If you go back into uh, the site homepage. So here's your content library. We can go down here and add something in. You know, let's get rid of this. This is a stock thing. And we could say, hey, you know what? I want to add a gallery of some things that I've brought into my content library. So it's automatically going to pull from that content library. And that's kind of the, the basic. And this kind of illustrates the click and drag very, you know, there's almost no code that needs to be done for this. Now you can, um, some of these text boxes, you can go to HTML coding and see, uh, maybe write your own, get some CSS styling in your, your items for any of you that are familiar with that. But you can change this stuff with just some Dropbox stuff, which is really one of the benefits of all of the Ezra products. They don't need you don't need to physically go in and write code and, and styles and tags. So, um, you know, you can change this to a big banner if you want. And it just quickly does all that stuff for you. So, um, and you can change, you know, any of this stuff. So real quick, like something you may want to do right off the bat. Hey, I like this really cool uh, picture, but maybe I want to bring in my own. So uh, I went ahead and I've got some photos I pulled off the internet. And just like that, your opening page is customized with a nice picture. So this kind of um, is the background of, of designing a, a hub site. And of course, you know, we could go into a lot of this stuff and how to set it up. But um, I kind of just wanted to show how easy it is to get started and 
what you can do right off the bat with your existing ArcGIS online subscription. So, um, but to loop back around, so this is something that we made or I made for um, kind of a test. We used Pekin's GIS and just kind of set up, hey, here's what it would look like. And this is, you know, a very rough draft, but uh, something that I took the basic hub site. So you can, if you remember, this is kind of the layout I had, but I changed uh, the background image and the title. And we've got some categories set up that were, you know, tailored to Pekin's data. So, uh, you know, if you click on these, then it's going to bring you anything that has um, what a tag in ArcGIS Online. So, uh, also, I made just as an example some public facing Survey 123 form. So you could embed one that's live and you can see the whole thing in your page, or you can do uh, what, what I've done here where I made a gallery like I showed you on the last test page, chose just my Survey 123 forms that were uploaded into my content library. And now when people come here, they can easily see, like, oh man, I, you know, there's a storm drain uh, that's constantly. Uh, flooding into my yard because it's so clogged with debris, leaves, and all that other stuff. So you know what? This is a great place. Like, hey, here you go. Let's launch this. Now you go ahead and fill out a Survey 123 form and um, let us know if it's a new request or an old request. This is the epitome of this public engagement that you're trying to get. So you may have already had these forms out there, but how do I get them uh, out to the public? Well, this is a great example. Now people can come in and submit uh, requests and and go from there and same thing with uh, maybe there's a damaged sidewalk so um, it's just a really cool and fun way at least for me I had a really fun time designing uh, this thinking of like what would it be like if I was the actual um, GIS person for a peak and I wanted to get this stuff out and then another gallery maybe you just want to uh, group together all of your web apps so um, and you can sort these and drag and drop however you want. You can have uh, multiple sections. So maybe just a web app for um, the public utilities or zoning or, you know, some of this stuff. But I just kind of threw together what they have out there already. And then as you scroll down, you can see um, there's a tie to some of the PDF maps, which, uh, you know, it's a, it's a digital age. It's 2020. But there's still a, a, a need or maybe a request for PDF maps. So uh, this was kind of a cool link to kind of throw back uh, what they have now. And so this kind of links uh, into, this is the original peak in site. And so just to kind of show the dichotomy, this is their GIS map page as it stands right now. So when you go into peak in site and you want to look for GIS data, this is what you get. And then the alternative is something like this, where the whole website is centered around GIS data. So, you know, if you are in the organization and you uh, have this ability to create a, a hub site and maybe look at what your, your city or your county or uh, your entity is offering now, maybe this is uh, the demonstration that you need to see to think, well, maybe we should, you know, ramp this up. Maybe we should, you know, kind of redo our site and how we share this data and really foster more public engagement because that's really what it's all about. You have all this data and it really doesn't do any good if you're just keeping it all internal and not sharing it with anyone because um, the more engagement we have, the more value you get out of all of this GIS data that you have. So um, that's just kind of a rundown. And I know I'm probably talking too fast because we're ahead of schedule, but um, there's certainly time for questions and I don't know. It's yeah. Nine four three, no. but um, no, you're doing great. We've got a couple here actually. Um, yeah, I can't see them. So. Uh, demo uh, question. Can you show adding the survey one, two, three form to hub? Uh, to get it embedded or I, I think you could, we can go in here too. So if you, uh, so here's the survey card. So we can add this down. I will insert a new row. So from here, then we can go back and pull in a survey. So here we want to select our survey. I 
go to public and looks like oh there's a bunch of ones so i guess my organization uh, well let's just show survey one about of myself I add, add the survey about myself i want to see what that is <laughs> So here's, uh, I guess, oh, so I'd have to save this and publish it. And so here's kind of the, an example of when you make these edits, this is a, a good segue to this. You have to save your site and this is kind of like a, a internal uh, development mode. It's saving your edits, but only after you click this and say publish, is it gonna publish whatever the, uh, the public facing side of this URL would be. So. Uh, now we can go into view published and this is actually the live version. So uh, in here now it's going to open the survey just like we had earlier. So there are kind of different ways to do it, uh, but let's see. Hey Hunter, can I add something to this? Yeah, sure. Um, what we see, what I see a lot is that when when organizers build a hub site, they don't want one more click to prevent someone from giving them data, right? We want public input, right? So if you go back to that, that uh, you have the ability to embed that survey directly in the site, or you can link to it like you showed there. Uh, so maybe in the we'll configurations do, of uh... it. I just see, I see that a lot in organizations because they would like to, they don't want that one more click to prevent someone being like, oh, I'm, you know what, I'm not going to take that survey. But if it's embedded in the site. So that was actually just a configuration of the, <clears throat> the previous one you had. Oh, this was? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The previous so, one. So, um, but yeah, if you, I guess I didn't get into the embedding, but um, you certainly can have it just running live in the page. But uh, were there other questions? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple in here. Um, do people use Hub to create page or site for permitting? Uh, I would. I think, and Mitch, you can probably answer this too, but I think that would be a great uh, initiative that you could do. And if you go into, um, you make a new site and look at some of these, um, if you go into Learn ArcGIS and there's the hub, there's one, all these different uh, trainings to go through getting started, but there's also uh, a bunch of galleries that you can look at, a gallery of items that you can see and kind of get that started. But I think with the right, you know, if you took the time to design it right, that would be a perfect example of something that an organization could start with to use Hub. You know, you have this one single site that's just tailored around uh, a project and that's where you kind of have the central repository of all of your data and how you share it with either an internal group that you've put together or uh, the external public. Uh, let's see, a couple more here. Um, how does the responder in the city get the notifications that a new survey has been submitted? That would be something we could, that would be like some custom coding that would go into uh, maybe using a program like Integromat or um, Integromat's probably the best one because uh, Esri had teamed up with Integromat to set up a bunch of functionality for uh, notifications to people uh, via text or email whenever um, a new thing is submitted. Um, and Mitch, you probably know more about that. Or I was going to say at that point, it's mostly a, um, a configuration of the Survey123 
survey rather than hub. In hub, we just take the survey and embed it into the application so that you can see that, which is fantastic. But then uh, the configuration, the communication between survey123 and Integromat and email and all that kind of stuff is more of a function of that. Am I, am I right? Um, the, the design I've done with Server123, we yeah. tested Integromat to send those notifications on a new submission. So um, I know it can work that way. But as far as the, the hub site, yeah, I don't, it, it wouldn't be initiating any, any notification just from the site. And so that probably dovetails into this. Um, can you show us how someone's, uh, how someone would submit a sidewalk claim? Yeah, uh, that would be, you can go in here and do the published. So, and again, Mitch had a good point. Maybe you want this to just open up in your actual page instead of linking out. But uh, so this, this is uneditable. It's already going to default to a damaged sidewalk. And I got some required fields in here, but this be a new request. Let's say yes. Uh, put in your name, and your email. So it's it's already not going to, if you don't have um, the common parameters of an email, it's going to throw you an error if you don't put in your phone number correctly. And it will let you know that that's not right. Uh, I better make sure that's 10. All right. And so then you would click on the map and, um, and you can open this up to full screen or you can use here. So let's say like, oh, you know what? Right here, there is a really bad sidewalk right in front of the house here. And it's already some back end coding. It's already pulling whatever address you clicked on the map, but then it gives you the chance to kind of put in, you know, maybe that wasn't exactly correct. And it was, you know, 712 Court Street. And, and see, it's I'm jumping the gun. This is what Server 123 is good at. This is why it can never go away. It tailors your entries to make sure that if somebody's trying to put in a bad entry, it's going to let you know. So that was Court Street. Oh, maybe not. For some reason, that's not going to take it. But uh, it's already got your city and state because this is uh, pulling from the map. We can at least assume that and then put in your, your zip code and maybe a quick description. And then you hit submit. And if there are errors, then it's going to let you know that uh, you know you didn't fill everything out right. But that's it. It's uh, it's that easy. They hit submit. It'll go, and then it'll go back to you know maybe they also had a storm drain request. So that's kind of the workflow of how it works with uh, at least what I've set up right now. And again, that's mostly the survey one two three configuration. And um, Mike, um, no, it was Matt. Um, Mike's kind of like the survey one, two, three person, but uh, is Matt, I think you're talking a little bit more in your inspection forms is about survey one, two, three at the end. Yes, uh, we will uh, We'll go through um, survey one, two, three connect and in, in the Excel form and kind of do a little quick tour of, of that. Yeah, great, awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks, Hunter. Um, guys, if you have any more questions related to Hub, uh, like I said before with Mitch's presentation, feel free to drop those in the chat box and get in touch with Hunter uh, directly through there. Um, we can answer things uh, the offline or later as things come up. Um, we're actually going to get ready for our breakout rooms. Um, before that, though, let's We've been sitting for a while and uh, honestly, I need a little bit of a break. So uh, let's take about five minutes, everybody, a uh, little break and we'll start back up around 10 o'clock. Um, I'll get everybody pushed out into the breakout rooms. 
um, that'll be a good time for just, like I said, some, some small group networking. And, and uh, we've got a couple canned questions to go through with you guys just to, to break the ice and get the conversation started. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, take about five minutes here. I'm gonna go grab some water and stretch my legs. Get some music playing back in the background so we're not too bored. Uh, but feel free to chat and talk amongst yourselves and we'll meet back here about 10 o'clock and get started with, that break with those uh, breakout rooms. Hey guys, uh, let's see, 1040 on the dot. Micah, you back? Yep. Good. Yeah. Looks like screen's up and ready to go. So, all right, guys, thanks for bearing with us here. We'll get back to it. Micah is going to start in on field mobility. Go ahead, Micah, take it away. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, glad to be here and talking to everybody about field mobility. I know that's. Um, uh, it was great to talk a little bit earlier with Mitch talked about some of the different apps that we're going to discuss. Um, very happy that he brought up ArcGIS fields. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is pretty much existing. Uh, the what, what we have is, as far as existing to us. Uh, let's see if I can get my uh, pointer here. All right. So the first question that I have is, how is Esri like Menards? And I don't know about you when when you go to Menards or whatever big box home improvement, if you've got a house or even don't have a house, I go there and I go there maybe for one or two things, looking for a light switch plate or something like that. And I just see all of everything. And I, I think I walk around the store and if I'm by myself, this especially happens. I just try to think of every project I could ever need and what I would need to finish that project because you just think, wow, look at all this stuff. What can I do? And I, I feel a little bit like uh, with Esri and especially with field mobility, you look at all of these applications and you think, wow, what can I do? Um, and you try to find maybe a project to fit inside the applications. The better way uh, maybe to do it is a little bit more naturally and not like, you know, besides, I, I couldn't do anything that I wanted to do anyway at Menards. Um, I'm not that uh, skilled with, with a hammer, but um, you still think of those things. And so uh, when, we, when we think about the, the, all the different apps um, at, that are out now, it, it gets a little bit overwhelming. And you think, wow, what, what should I do? I should be doing something with these. We've already got them, right? We've already got this, these tools. Um, what, what can we do? And so whether it's a quick capture or collector or explorer or workforce or navigator or tracker or survey one, two, three, those are all good and, and wonderful and helpful tools to have. Um, and just to kind of break them down a little bit. And, and we already talked about the ones that are getting wrapped up into our GIS fields, which is great, but right now they're not. So let's, let's talk about some of those. And the biggest one that everybody uses is ArcGIS Collector. Um, you've kind of used, you've, you've seen these, this demoed. It's been around for quite a while in various versions and formats and things. Uh, but it's, it's Esri's field collection tool. You go out with this, you collect information, and it gets added back to your GIS, whether that's on AGO or that's internally on, on the server or, uh, or however you use that, uh, but we all have a tendency to use to use uh, that. I would say the second most popular tool and getting gaining in popularity is Survey One Two Three. We've already seen some of that uh, with with the uh, Survey One Two Three and and the integration that Hunter showed us with Hub and how that easy that is to be able to integrate it. Well, there's also just an app uh, to, to use Survey123 and to go out and collect information. And we'll see a little bit later on how we can do that with inspections, or you can do that with cross-connect surveys or uh, you know inspection surveys or tree inspections or however it is. It's when the map doesn't have to be web-based. That's a great time to use that. And, and uh, you know if you're going from a form, a paper form, just like Mitch said, into GIS, that's the perfect time to use that. Uh, Explorer. Explorer is the non-editing version of Collector. Um, Explorer, I want to encourage you guys, I, I think it's it's the best app that you're not using. So it is a way in order to get the GIS data and the apps out to your people in the field, out to the public. And I'll show an example of that here uh, really quickly, if I can just pull this over. Um, 
uh, you know, I don't know if I'm showing, uh, let me stop share and share something else. Sorry. Uh, Um, Winnebago GIS uses uh, their to do to do to get out to the public to be on a be on a phone. They use uh, Explorer. So if you would actually log into Explorer and search for Winnebago GIS, you would see. Uh, screen sharing is paused. Is it okay? Sorry, guys. There's that. Um, so. If you go to Winnebago's GIS, you can actually see that uh, they have Explorer as that's how they use for their sharing. Uh, so if we would actually log into and look at um, on on a phone, let me let me open up. Um, you should be seeing my phone now. Uh, and if I go to Explorer, and I'm not logged in to Explorer, there's this. So this is Explorer is a public um, application that you can get. Anybody can get. And I search for WinGIS. Oh, if I spell it right, um, there's the Winnebago County Public Property Search, uh, and they've got a couple other ones on there too. Um, you saw Boone County and Stevenson County because that's Winnebago helps everybody. Uh, I can zoom in and I'm, I'm looking at their data in the public so you can kind of see and interact with this application without having to log in. So it's a great way to be able to share your data out to the public and Winnebago C County does that uh, really well. Uh, so uh, there are other ways to use Explorer if you just don't trust people to, in, in order to edit data. Um, I shouldn't say that. I should be more diplomatic, but that's the truth. If you don't trust them to be able to do that, then that's the um, a way to be able to give them information, give them data without really having them to do that. So I'm um, gonna go back to the slideshow here. All right. And then, um, so workforce and tracker. Let's talk about these two for a few minutes. Workforce, believe it or not, has been around since 2016. That's when it was first released. I was, it was first talked about and, and, and brought up. Um, so the whole idea with workforce and tracker, there's a lot of uh, examples on YouTube or on uh, other, uh, you, you can get a lot of um, how that works how you can kind of send it with using workforce, you can assign tasks, you can plan, uh, you can send work. Um, it just turned, workforce just turned offline in this, this last spring. You can now use workforce offline on your phone. So obviously you, you can't communicate with, with a, um, with a, uh, uh, no, sorry, my poll popped up. Uh, you can't. Sorry, my bad. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know what? Um, I, speaking of polls, that's a, rem that, that's a good reminder. Thanks, Bill. I don't know if you intended that or not, but I was going to put a poll to you guys uh, to see what, what tools you're using. Um, can we toss that poll up? Is that possible? Yes. Uh, sorry. One second. <laughs> I was editing. There we go. There you go. Okay. All right. So the poll just popped up. And what we're looking for is for you guys to say, even if you've just done it once, even if you just tried it, uh, what and you can select all of them or each one that you have used if you're using collector or if you have ever, ever, ever have uh, or if you're locked in on collector survey one two three explorer quick capture navigator tracker workforce I've only got nine people come on I feel like uh, uh, you know somebody doing a um, uh, whatever thon you know uh, Get more uh -huh. people to, yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and close. Okay. Okay, so obviously, Collector, which is what I assumed, Collector kind of won with uh, yeah, the respondents. 89% of the respondents use Collector. Workforce, we've got one person using Workforce, Quick Capture, uh, Survey123, six out of the nine, and Explorer. So those are, uh, that's actually kind of, in line with what I've uh, what I've heard and what I've seen, collector by and large is being used. Survey one two three, and Explorer. Um, Navigator is uh, another thing that we've got somebody using Navigator. That's great. Um, I don't even know if I have a Navigator icon. Navigator is a, a, a for off for routing. 
essentially. For offline routing, uh, you can add custom roads to if you've got like um, you're going into the forest or something like that and you have your company has custom and private roads, you can add those private roads to Navigator and still route to them. Um, so route to your assets and things like that. And and that's, that's a way to use Navigator. It's also offline. Uh, ex Explorer, so, so Tracker is, is a newer application. And to be able to talk about Tracker is you have to opt in to being tracked. And it might be a thing that you have to discuss with, uh, you know, uh, your workers or, or what they're doing or how, but it's, it's mostly it's you opt into being this, you know, it's not something you can secretly put on somebody's phone and track them. So uh, if it's public safety thing, if there's a big event and you want to know where all your, um, your police uh, uh, are, all your fire departments or EMTs or something like that, you turn on tracking and then you can kind of watch where you go. Um, tracking it does have to be enabled. It's for ArcGIS Online and, and Enterprise. Both of those are, are able to be used. Um, and then workforce is the same type of, you know, you have to uh, opt in to be able to be used and, and to using that and, and gets deployed, all right? Um, what I really wanna kinda take some time on is to talk about Quick Capture. Uh, and I wanna show some examples. Oh, reminder. Uh, all of these four items, Collector, Survey123, Explorer, and Quick Capture, have are available in, in Windows 10. So if you have a tablet using Windows 10, or if you're using Windows 10 on a laptop and an environment, you, the Windows Store has all four of these applications that you can actually go to and download and use uh, on your organization for uh, in Windows and Windows 10. And most all of them have you know iOS and Android as as connectivity too. I really want to kind of spend some of the time focused on Quick Capture. And to do that, I want to uh, I want to share. I'm just going to share my whole screen. Uh, let me open this. All right, I'm going to share my whole desktop just so you can see everything. Because I'm going to slide hey, things question. in. And out. Go ahead. Um, I see that the. Uh, seminar is being recorded. Is there any way that we could get a, uh, a link to that when it's all over with, just for reference? You will. Yes, okay. yes. Everyone that attended, I will send that out once it's all kind of cleaned up. Uh, yes, I will, I'll send that out to everybody. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, if I want to talk about, I want to kind of focus a little bit on quick capture and some of the, the with the time that we've got, I actually want to do a demo and walk through the creating of an application or a couple of different applications. But one of the things that I wanted to do is, is quick captures is new. And uh, I want to discuss the difference between like a collector map and, um, and a, uh, a quick capture application. So, Collector, if you've used Collector, which most people who responded use Collector, uh, you're basing it on a, a map, right? So you create a map as the GIS person or as the person who's in charge or been given the assignment to do it, whatever. It, you don't have to have GIS in your title, but you, you create a map with layers. And in this map, you can add points. You know, you can select an animal problem and click on the points and enter the information and add the point. No big deal, right? So that gets added. Um, help me remember where I put that just south of, uh, I think it's probably LNU right there. Uh, and so you you can add a map to that. And so collector works the same way. I'm gonna slide this over and go to collector. I'm gonna go to the same web map, citizen problem web map. You can see that's listed there. And I'm gonna click on that web map and it's gonna load the information. Right, so it zooms me here to where I'm at. So, uh, of course, because that's enabled by default. Look, there's a there's a problem there. So I'm going to go back to the uh, where I was adding. Uh, okay, so there's my point that I just literally added a couple seconds ago. So you can see the interaction. We can be here, and if we and if we hit add a point, it's going to say we're going to add. Uh, okay, uh, of course. This is always kind of a problem. And this, I'm assuming, will probably be better. Uh, 
let's add a point just so we can kind of see it's here off um, oh, along the river. So we add the points and it, add the information. We're going to add the blight problems there to that, that points and hit submit. And that's, I'm not adding, in the interest of time, I'm not adding any attribute information, okay? So I just added the points right along the river um, as a blight problem. And if I zoom in or zoom out on the web map, there's, there's the, the problem that I just added, okay? So this is a very map-based workflow. It's great, it's synchronous, you add it on the app, it adds on your web map. You know, if you're in the office and we'll see dashboards later, you can add this map to a dashboard and do all kinds of cool widgets and pie charts and things like that using Collector, okay? What about Quick Capture and why is it easier for some people? Well, um, and maybe what are some hangups, okay? So Quick Capture is, uh, is available, um, in your, if you go to your home page on ArcGIS Online, um, call this the app launcher. I call it the Brady Bunch button. Somebody calls it the waffle button, whatever it is, but it's up here in the corner. Uh, you can then go to uh, quick capture is, is this icon. So we add quick capture and I go to the, the launch on ArcGIS Online to, to do this in quick capture. Um, and I got a couple of different things, right? So I've got some existing objects or some existing projects, and I've got some, um, a lot of things that I can add. So in order to create a new project, I've already got this open here. Um, I'm just gonna close one of these tabs. Uh, so I'm gonna add a new project. When I hit add new projects, I can do a couple of things. Quick Capture is based on not web maps like collector and explorer it's based on layers so you're editing a layer right off the bat and and the whole idea of quick capture is to be able to do it quickly and easily but part of the work is you have to do that in the front end in order to do that so if i say start from existing layers i can literally choose any layer that we have on our arcgis online or any layer that has been shared with me on arcgis online or enterprise if you have if you happen to log into that and use that so all of these layers that I have available to me I'm going to select a debris layer and hit next and you say okay debris layer and uh, where am I going to save this and create this project and it's creating a, a, um, a quick capture project what it does it looks at my layer it adds the symbology to my, my um, display here. And then each one of these buttons are particular symbology types in my layer. What do I mean by that? All right, if I'm gonna go back to contents, I'm gonna find this same uh, problem, this debris report, reports. Uh, and I've got this debris reports, I'm gonna type, uh, I'm gonna go to my contents. And there's the debris layer. This is a hosted feature layer on ArcGIS Online. And in this, if I visualize the data, I've got all of these different types already specified. So think of this like a, a feature layer that you've got from, from Enterprise or some layer that you've got on ArcGIS Online or some layer that you create. We'll talk about that in a minute. All of these different items that happen to pop up in my quick capture form are some symbology layers, different symbology that I can that I can add. Right. So because quick capture is is integrated with ArcGIS Online, it sees that symbology and adds it to my quick capture. Right. So all of this is is all these points right now. I hit save. That's essentially a project that is already created. And I, all I did was point it at that one layer. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna go to my uh, iPhone again, and I'm gonna hit the quick capture icon. I've got nothing in here because it, 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 it connects to your organization. I'm signed in, but I have to hit add. 
and I can see I can scan a QR code and I don't know if you saw that popped up down in the corner just display the QR code or uh, I can hit share over here and and see the the QR code again or share it with a particular person or whatever it doesn't matter let me go back to this um, a browse projects my existing projects and I've got this debris layer one that I just uh, created so if I go into that, it downloads that project. It's not downloading the data. It's downloading the project. And I have that in my workspace then. And I open it up. And guess what it looks like? Exactly what I'm looking like on what it looks like on the, uh, on the, the designer, right? I can go in. And when I hit this, I'm going to click on it with my finger. And I'm going to click on vehicles. And it just adds a new point. To the, to the map, it adds a point, just like that. And, and so it's very quick and quick capture to add the point. And so uh, when I go in back to my debris layer, it's probably gonna be down here where I'm at. So let me zoom into Roanoke. Yep, see it just popped up. So right where I'm sitting because of course, that's what it's actually adding is the vehicles and it's an abandoned vehicle. And all I did was click the button on quick capture and, and then added it. All right. So it's very quick in order to do that. What about if you want more information? Let's get into that a little bit. So with that same, uh, let's add the, uh, if I highlight and I'm back in the designer, if I highlight um, this, this button, I can customize the button. A, I can change the name. So electronics, all right? I can change the image. I can make a different shape or a different size or, or whatever it is. Uh, I can change the rounding of it. I can give it a background. All that junk that you wanna be able to add that is so great to be able to, to make it customized. Um, but I can also set some preset data points, right? So what I did was I just added one particular point. It was the GPS, that moment in time that I clicked the button, what my phone thought its GPS point was. So that is a, a, a thing for you to keep in mind. It was only based on the accuracy of my GPS point on my phone at that point. So that, you know, the GPS accuracy, in fact, it tells you right at the bottom of Quick Capture what your GPS accuracy is. Uh, let me move this. He says the accuracy, of my GPS because I'm on Wi-Fi is 213 feet. Not great. Uh, what you can do then is you can uh, you can add certain things to be able to kind of say I don't want you to be able to capture unless you're less than 35 feet or some type of accuracy. But it's taking just the GPS of your phone at that time. All right, so it's important for you guys to uh, know that the accuracy is based on the accuracy of the phone. Uh, so I'm inside on Wi-Fi, so there's pretty gross accuracy. So aside from that, I can say, yeah, you know what? I want you to take a photo when you click that button. Back on this. Um, take a photo uh, at that moment of time. Um, you know what? Don't even show the preview. So it'll just shoot out the back of whatever you're looking at when you click on the button. Uh, and then let's, let's enter some uh, fields. And so details to say, hey, this is default. Uh, some name, um, email or whatever. So you're entering all these pre-entered um, pre points, right? And, and then you were adding a specific, um, we can say variable, capture the time of the phone at the, at the points, whatever it is. That's, that's uh, easy enough. And I hit save. And then back on my phone, uh, I'm gonna go back out of this and it says, hey, hey, you got an update. You probably need to update this because whoever was updating this updated some of the, the project because I just did, we, we, you saw it. So I'm gonna hit on the I and say, yep, go ahead and update. It'll re-download the project. Now when, when I go back into the project, I see my uh, icon is bigger. It um, has a little extra icon there. And all that does is when I click on this, 
this will be like inception. Uh, it'll add the points. Uh, I just added another point for electronics and it took a picture. Let's go back to the debris layer. Hopefully, I'll take a few. Yep. There, okay. So there's my there's my uh, electronics that I just added, and it's uh, oh one of two. Uh, so I'm sitting on my point. So okay. So there's the enter of the default information that you added. It added the timestamp and it added the picture. And I you didn't see anything pop up. It's not even in focus. Uh, but it just took a, a instantaneous picture of whatever that is. There wasn't a shutter click. There wasn't the preview pop up where I got to make sure. You can do all that if you wanted to, but at this, uh, just to be able to do a quick capture, that's the whole point. Hold up the phone, hit the button, done. And so it's a little bit easier for, for um, people who aren't as versed to having collector or adding things or, you know, if you want to have all of that expertise, great use collector, but quick capture is really designed to be able to grab information quickly and easily in order to do that. One last thing that I do want to show, um, I'm doing fine. One last thing that I do want to show, let's go back to the home page of quick capture. I want to create a new project. Say, okay, I'm, I'm new. I have ArcGIS login. I don't have any data. Um, and this is kind of harkens back to a little bit what Mitch was talking about, about the um, solutions. So I'm going to create a new project. I want to use a template. Fine. Start from templates. These are fantastic and they're easy and they're, they can be pushed out um, publicly, you know, all of these things. So, uh, so we got, um, take your pick, um, road debris. So uh, if I hit road debris, it gives me a template and you say, sure, let's use that template. Give it a road debris. Where do you want to put it? Because it's going to put a project and a layer on your, on your uh, ArcGIS online. So it's creating the projects. What it's doing in the background is also creating a feature layer on your ArcGIS online. So this requires whoever to do this to be a publisher uh, or a creator level license. Um, so this, that's what that requires. All right. So I don't know, it blinked there for a second and added that and it has all these cool icons on it. And if I wanted to customize one of these, I'm customizing it the same way I would customize it with my own data. I can add a specific um, field. Oh man, I shouldn't have said kilometers per hour. Uh, let's say uh, speed miles per hour. And we're here in America, so don't let's not let's not do that. I want to change that um, button name. Parents, oh, I'm failing at this. I've clicked that button, I changed the parents name, road sign, data. Maybe this was, should be a little bit more worked through. It's fine, It's I'm not gonna change that right now. <laughs> well, that's the name of the field, I'm sorry, my bad. That's the name of the field. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna hit save on this and as I, uh, do that if I go back to my home page, I'll see that I have that road debris reporter. And the same thing with my phone. I'm gonna go back to my workspace. I have to hit the button down at the bottom or I browse projects. The road debris reporter is there, has the download icon, it downloads that icon. Now I can edit a point. I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit three of I'm gonna hit these middle these middle uh, three right here. So road marker litter, roadkill, vegetation. So all really quickly, I just added a location of, of my, um, my spots of a road marker, litter, vegetation, and roadkill. All right, those are the things that I, that I did. So if we go back to ArcGIS Online, I'm gonna go navigate back to my content. And under my uh, root, 
this is what it's added. It's added this Road Debris Reporter Quick Capture Project, and it's also added a hosted feature layer called Road Debris Reporter. So if I look at that, and just for, um, for us to be able to see that it captured the data, if I look at this data, there are four, pe four features that I just hit. Uh, so it went over, if I go, it should be, there's, okay, so litter, roadkill, vegetation, road marker. And it didn't add any photos or files or information because I didn't set any of that. I just used the template straight from Esri. So in about, you know, five minutes, I created based on the, a template, I created a, uh, an application that I can then say, okay, go ahead and um, if there's road debris, put it in. So it's, it's kind of a very quick way. And um, there's a little bit of concern about the accuracy. So you have to be aware of that. And also there's a little bit of concern about safety. This is not intended for the driver to do. Okay, I know we all have mounts on our phones in order to put it up on our dash, but this is uh, not intended for the driver to be able to do. It's just an easier capture device with somebody with gloves on or somebody who's not adept to knowing where they're at. You know, they just want to be able to click quick capture right here at the points and it communicates then back to the office in order to see that uh, those things. So uh, I don't know, we did a little bit more of a deeper dive into, uh, into quick capture, but it was kind of a, a benefit. To, I think it's, it's a great tool that we can roll out uh, that are easier, easier tools to be able to do that. Um, Bill, do we have any questions? I think I'm, um, I'm at a half hour. So if we have any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, you're good on time. Nothing coming in so far, guys. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat room. Uh, you can send them to Micah directly. Um, if you feel comfortable, uh, you can unmute yourself and, and ask it live. I don't mind that either. Uh, but uh, that was that was a good presentation. Went over a lot, but that was good. Plenty of time there. So we'll give it a couple minutes, guys, and feel free to go ahead and stretch your legs and. Is the Quick Another Capture couple. available in, um, is this a solution that's deployable in the portal environment also, or is this something that's just available in RTS Online? Great question. No, yes. Uh, uh, no, yes. No, yes. Yes, it is available in, in Enterprise uh, in order to do that. And um, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Mitch will pipe in if it's not. But yes, you can do that on Enterprise. Um, I th I'm pretty sure the only thing you can't do on Enterprise for those things, uh, for those fuel mobility is story maps. Uh, but yes, Quick Capture is available on, on in portal environment. In addition to that, <clears throat> just a general pattern that we see is that functionality and in general, this isn't the same for all products, but in general, you see a lot of functionality added to ArcGIS Online first, and then the, the portal follows. Yep. So you can do both. Good to note. Well, guys, uh, moving right along, I don't see anything else popping up, but uh, like I said, feel free to message Micah directly if something else comes up. I know he's ready and willing to answer questions for you guys. So we are gonna transition over to our next presenter, Mike, Mike Gennard, one of our GIS techs here. He's gonna go over infrastructure asset dashboards and Mike, we were talking earlier, I think we're going to start with your poll question. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, thanks, Bill. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do a, just a brief introduction here, and mm -hmm. then we'll open up with a poll question after. Yep. Uh, so, uh, like Bill was saying, I'm going to do a presentation today on dashboards, specifically dashboards in context of asset management. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is just we're going to walk through some basics of that operation dashboard, and then we're going to take a deep dive into um, showing them how to configure them, some of the options we have there. And also we're gonna take a look at a lot of examples and just kind of see what's out there when it comes to dashboards. And as uh, Mitch touched on earlier, uh, dashboards have really been gaining steam. 
uh, as recently even as he pointed out with the John Hopkins dashboard. This one I, I feel like was kind of just plastered you know, to our TVs, to our, our computer screens, and it really brought a lot of attention to the potential of dashboards. Uh, so uh, like I said, we're, we're starting to see more and more. So we're going to go over some, some asset management dashboards today. And like Bill mentioned, let's go ahead and let's, let's open the room. Let's gauge the room. This is my lame attempt at humor. Uh, but I do have some poll questions for everybody. Uh, so really, I just want to know people's uh, experience level with operations dashboard, whether or not um, you've used one, whether or not uh, your organization is currently utilizing Operations Dashboard, and whether or not you've actually built or configured a dashboard yourself. So I'll just give this a little bit. We'll get some answers coming in. Almost there. Good responses so far. Looks pretty split, really. I'm only slightly offended that more people are responding to yours. <laughs> Like a southern politician trying to get people to donate to a cause. <laughs> well, I won't do any pandering, so I, I, but feel free to answer at uh, at your leisure. And it looks like we're pretty much there. Yep, I'll go ahead and close it here. And yeah, and it looks like we're we're split. Share results. Yeah, pretty split. So uh, the the third question there is the one that I'm pretty much most interested in: whether or not people have actually built or configured. Uh, and operations dashboard. So it looks like we're leaning a little bit more towards no, uh, which is good. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll kind of uh, go through the basics of building a dashboard, you know, some of the configuration options we have available to us. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll dive into a demo uh, of some of the stuff that we can do and show you just how easy it is really to, to build and configure these dashboards. Uh, and then we'll look at some examples. So thanks, Bill, for launching that poll. Let's go ahead, and this is just kind of an operations dashboard overview, and, and I pulled this straight from Esri because I feel like they worded this really well when it comes to what dashboards are. So operations dashboard for Ar ArcGIS is a configurable web app that provides location-aware data visualization and analytics for a real-time, that's, that's key, for a real-time operational view of people, services, assets, and events. So from a dashboard, we can see the activities and performance indicators that are most vital and most important to your organization's objectives. So what does that mean? What are dashboards? Uh, as it, the quote just pointed out, dashboards are visualizations of your data. Uh, and they visualize your data through highly configurable and highly interactable um, elements within the dashboard. Uh, some key configurable elements of a dashboard usually include a, a map or multiple maps of your data and whatever we're looking at. Uh, there's usually a lot of charts, uh, usually gauges, indicators, uh, some lists of our data. So combined uh, with all these different elements, dashboards are, again, like I said, highly uh, interactable and they're highly configurable. No one dashboard really is the same from, from another. Of course, they can be, but again, a lot of dashboards that I like to see are, are very unique and they fit certain purposes and, and they have certain goals. Um, and dashboards uh, provide the ability to view status and performance metrics of our assets, uh, like our culverts, you know, our, our bridges, our structures, our, our street signs, uh, you know, our hydrants, whatever asset you have, um, or, or even people or services. And again, we can see those all in real time. That's a, a key benefit of dashboards. However, I like to do, I like to point out that dashboards are not certain things. And I say a primary editing environment. And I say that kind of with a caveat that uh, of course, much like hub, we can actually embed items within the dashboard. Uh, so for example, we can embed a survey within a dashboard that we can use to collect uh, data right from within the dashboard itself. We don't even have to leave it, but I, I do like to say dashboards are more visualizations of data. That's whether, whether that's collected out in the field using quick capture, like Micah had just showed us, um, collector, uh, survey one, two, three. Uh, so it, again, while, it, while it's possible through an embedded content, I, I do like to say dashboards are not a primary editing environment. You're not going into a dashboard to edit and maintain data. Uh, they are not a, a one size fits all solution. Like I said before, they're highly co uh, configurable um, to meet uh, certain uh, metrics or, or to view certain assets. Uh, so again, one dashboard is not a, a cookie cutter cutout of another dashboard. So how, how do dashboards work? So really it's, it's just as simple as launching the solution. You begin with a, a blank template. From there, you can build out your dashboard by adding those elements that I mentioned earlier. We're gonna utilize maps, uh, charts, gauges, 
indicators and lists uh, to break down our data and to give us visualizations of those metrics that we want to see of our data. We're going to incorporate all that data within the dashboard. From there, you can configure the layout so you can, you can put those uh, elements within the dashboard where you want them to live uh, so you can better kind of maintain and manage uh, the end user's flow throughout the dashboard. Uh, you can guide them throughout the, uh, by configuring the layout how you want them to be guided. Uh, and the next step is to integrate that interactivity. So within those elements, we can interact with those. We can make selections from them. We can um, filter our data by those elements. And I'll show you some of that within our demos as well. And from there, once your dashboard is built, you've got your elements in there, you've got your layout configured and your interactivity built in within those elements. From there, we can share a dashboard to whatever the end user will be, whether that's um, the general public or whether that's an administrative group within your organization. Um, from there, that's kind of the last step to getting that dashboard out into the hands of the end users. So really what makes a good dashboard? Why do some dashboards stand out uh, as opposed to some others? Well, before, like I, like I kind of mentioned, we have to determine the dashboard's audience. Who is going to be the end user? Who's going to be using this dashboard? Because as we know, uh, with the, the other Esri apps, uh, different user groups are going to require different data and functionalities built within them. So if we're making a dashboard for the public to be able to consume, maybe we're going to trim back some of the, the elements within that dashboard. Maybe we'll give them a map to give them a visualization of, of the spatial location of certain data or certain assets. Uh, maybe we'll give them a list and some graphs, but it, for an administrator, they might want to see a more detailed, a more in-depth breakdown and visualization of that data. So we might have a lot more um, charts and elements and stuff within our dashboard as opposed to some of the just a, you know, a quick uh, dashboard with a few elements. So we really, next, we want to decide what the dashboard's focus is going to be. So what data is most important to our end users? What, what performance metrics do they value over other performance metrics? And how can we uh, make those front and center within our dashboard? Next is going to be selecting the proper elements to best display our data, best uh, show those performance metrics. Um, so certain, uh, certain dashboard elements portray and have different interactivity uh, within their data differently than others. So again, how, how can we best display those key performance metrics uh, that we're most interested in? Uh, and that's gonna depend on how we build our elements. And again, uh, how they're arranged also can make a big difference within the dashboard as well. So what are some of the benefits of using dashboards? Well, dashboards help to provide an encompassing view of, of all of our data, whatever we're interested in, in tracking to better help inform organizational decision-making. And that's key uh, because that's what it's about. That's about using our, our locational aware data to help us perform uh, and analyze our data and, and make actions to move forward with. Uh, we're gonna be able to customize our data to uh, display that data as, as you see fit. And we also have the ability, like I said before, we're gonna be able to see our data in real time. So if somebody makes updates to that data, we're gonna be able to see those updates real time within our dashboard. And using the dashboards, we can identify that those key data trends and characteristics that we're most interested in uh, to move forward and help us make those action plans and, and stuff like that. So now that I've just got a, a, quick, a quick brief overview of, of kind of what dashboards are, how we can make them, um, what are some of the key stuff we're looking for in dashboards? I'd like to go ahead and do some demos uh, and, and look at some good examples of some asset management focused dashboards so we can kind of see how this stuff all just ties together. Let me go ahead and exit. Open up some of these. All right, so here is uh, the Highway Manager dashboard and this is for Stark County, Illinois. I like to show this one off just because it, it includes multiple assets uh, that they're able to see within their their one dashboard. So uh, we'll kind of use this as uh, kind of a model too that we can go in and we can change some of the settings and we can kind of play around with this too. So this is the kind of basic structure of a dashboard. When we look at a dashboard, we're gonna be able to see again, all of these different elements uh, within the dashboard to help us convey, convey that data back to us. So here what I've done is I, I've created a few data filters for their dashboard. We can see this is kind of an overview tab. I have several tabs uh, kind of stacked on top of each other here in this dashboard. We can see this overview tab is gonna give us an overview of all the structures that they're most interested in. So their, um, their bridges, their culverts, and their county highways. Uh, we're gonna be able to see all of those, those uh, assets here on the overview page. 
if I flip forward to uh, the individual tabs, I'm going to have the, the ability to break down those different assets and, and have some more elements uh, associated with those and, and break that data down a little bit further for us. So if I go back to the overview page, uh, we're going to see these are some good examples of some elements available to us within a dashboard that we can use to convey uh, our data to our end users. So here I can see I, I've got a, just a pie chart of the structure condition of my structures in Stark County. Um, I also have just a kind of a, a quick legend here, a breakdown of how many structures fall within that category. So say I want to see the amount of structures that are just very good. So if I go ahead and I can interact with this element, I can select, hey, just show me, uh, it's basically filtering my data based on my selection within the element itself in the dashboard. So you can see when I selected very good, it updated the total number of structures that are listed as in very good condition. And it, and it also uh, went ahead and filtered the average sufficiency rating of those structures. So say right now I can only select one. Say maybe I want to do, um, for whatever reason, maybe I want to select multiple. I want to be able to interact uh, with this element a little bit differently than I do now. So when it comes to configuring an element, we just have certain options available to us. With each one, we can move it, we can rearrange it within the layout itself. So if we wanted this to be docked somewhere else, we can simply move it throughout the dashboard. If we wanted to configure some of these settings uh, and how we have this element structured, we can go uh, configure those here within the specific element itself. So I'll go ahead and I'll click configure. Here it's just gonna give me several different tabs of, and layers of configuration that I have uh, available to me that I can use to configure this element. So here we're seeing what layer it's pulling from. We can add a filter if we wanted to do so. Uh, we can see how we want our, uh, our element to be structured. We're pulling categories from group values and we're giving it a field. So in this element, show me the structure condition field. And we can also see any statistics too available with us. So I'm just showing the total number of structures uh, as they're defined in the structure condition field. Next, we can even customize some of the stuff on our chart here. Um, so we can say, we can edit text color, um, all this good stuff uh, available to us here. I won't dive too much into that. But we can even uh, go ahead and we can update colors. Um, we can uh, manage any of the little minor stuff within our elements. And when I say highly configurable, they are very highly configurable. Uh, you can uh, configure really basically any part of this element to fit your needs. One thing I would like to point out too is this actions. So this is kind of where our interactivity is built in with these dashboard elements. So when I say, uh, when I make a selection within my dashboard element, I can add a target to filter. Or what I could even do is I could even, in some elements I can uh, zoom to uh, my features, my selected features, I can make them flash, make them stand out in the map. Uh, so certain elements also have more layers of interactivity built in uh, in those specific elements as well. Say I wanna change my selection mode to multiple. I'll go ahead and I'll just make that a simple change. I'll click done to update uh, this dashboard element reflect those updates I've made. So now, whereas before I would just select one and it would filter um, the element and the subsequent uh, infographics, I, it would just be that one selection. But since I've made it a multiple selection, what I can do now is I can select another uh, attribute from this dashboard element and it's going to allow me to interact with that uh, element uh, differently than before. And again, I have kind of some of the same uh, configurations built in across this specific dashboard for continuity for the end users. So again, if I wanted to interact with the culverts types the same way, I would simply, again, select uh, from, the, from the element itself and it filters um, the total counts at the top. Say I wanted to add a new element to this specific dashboard. Well, I would do so up here from this little plus button kind of on the top ribbon here of the operations dashboard menu. From here, you can see all the different things that we can add into our dashboard to help us see those performance metrics of our assets. So I can add in a map, I can give it a header, I can give it a legend, a chart, um, a pie chart or a serial chart, uh, indicators, which are kind of like these numbers here that just kind of give us a, uh, an indicator of, of, in this case, our number of assets. We can give us some gauges, some lists, some details, or we can even embed content into our dashboards. So that's kind of the process for adding in and configuring elements. Um, so I'll kind of utilize some of these filters real quick. We'll kind of do a quick demo of this. Say I wanted to go to my culverts assets and I'm going to want to 
uh, filter some of these so I can better see some data associated with these certain types of culverts that I'm most interested in. So say I wanted to select my culverts by their specific uh, conditions. Say I'm interested in coming up with a plan to maintain my culverts and I want to kind of just use my dashboard here to help me come up with that plan based on some of the as asset uh, attributes. So I want to look at my culverts that are in serious condition. These are going to be the ones I'm going to focus my efforts most heavily on uh, moving forward as I plan uh, for next year's uh, construction schedule for uh, however much I need to do to uh, update these culverts and make them better. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select from my filter culverts that are in serious condition. And again, what I've done is I've built in uh, some uh, interactivity between these elements so that when I select a filter, it's filtering not only my map, it's not, it's not just filtering those uh, features from my map, it's also filtering uh, my selection from my other elements as well. You can see my culvert types uh, graph was also filtered to reflect those uh, culverts that meet that specific uh, filter condition. And you can also see my list and my infographic changed here as well uh, to kind of update that. So again, it's, it's very highly configurable in dashboards. You can configure all these elements to, to talk with each other, to interact with each other. Um, say I, didn't, I, I necessarily didn't want um, my filters to be able to filter these specific elements. Well, I, just can, I can configure that uh, so that's not the case. But that just kind of shows how, how highly configurable some of these dashboards are. So again, even if I wanted to get even more specific with my culverts, say I wanted to see the culverts that are in serious condition and that are uh, the corrugated metal pipe culverts. I can select that from here and it's even gonna further filter um, my culverts here as well. Say I also wanna look at a specific culvert, well here from my list that I've added into this dashboard, I can go ahead and I can select a culvert I can have it zoom into the culvert. Um, I can select the culvert from the map. I can, I can see the, the pop-up within the map to show me some additional information regarding my culvert. Um, so this is a, a good example I like to show of, of kind of just an overview of, um, uh, uh, an overview of asset management for a dashboard. The next one I like to show, this is for a road center line, a PCI inspection dashboard. Uh, this is one that we put together for the village of Western Springs. And it kind of operates along the same, uh, same guide as the highway managers dashboard that we just looked at. Uh, but this one is for adding uh, MPCI, their modified PCI inspections for their, uh, for their road center lines. Here we can see we've got filters kind of again along the same side. We can select our PCI inspections by the year that they were performed. We can select by the actual rating that they received, by the average uh, daily traffic on these roads. Uh, we can select by the road base, the road type, and by street name as well. So here we have, a, again, we're utilizing tabs to kind of stack data on top of each other, to stack these uh, different dashboard elements on top of each other to separate our dashboard out. Uh, we're looking, again, at an overview tab. So here we're seeing just the uh, PCI inspection records that were submitted in, from Ju uh, July, or, excuse me, January 1st of 2019 to December 31st of 2019. And that uh, filter is also filtering our other dashboard elements as well, not just our map. So much like our other dashboard, we're using these filters to uh, better help us visualize the data that we are most interested in here. If I go to the MPCI by road tab, it's gonna break it down a little bit further and let me interact with these um, uh, PCI inspections on per road center line uh, individually. But what I'd really like to point out here is what I did was I just kind of made a, a copy of this dashboard that I could play around with it. And what I did was I embedded a survey form within this dashboard. So this is the survey form that is used to uh, inspect these road center lines uh, and perform the PCI inspections out in the field. So as their crew is uh, going out, they're driving on each road, they have this survey form pulled up in survey one, two, three, and they can just fill it out as they go. And when they're done, they submit it and it lives as a related record uh, to that specific road center line. And this will be kind of a process that Matt will get into a little bit later in his uh, survey one, two, three demo. So I won't want to step on his toes here, but I did want to point out with this, again, we can embed uh, this survey one, two, three form within our dashboard as well. So if we had a dashboard that we uh, say had the capability or wanted to have the capability of uh, kind of updating data or collecting data from within the dashboard itself, we do have that ability within the dashboard to embed a survey one, two, three form or to embed a web app or embed a web map uh, within that dashboard as well. So that is one thing I did want to point out with this uh, particular dashboard. The next one I want to go ahead and look at is from 
uh, John's Creek, which is also utilizing a data hub to kind of tie back into even Hunter's presentation. Uh, we can embed these dash or have these dashboards within our data hub too as well. So here's one that they've got uh, in John's Creek, it's just a, a public works uh, projects dashboard to help convey to the public, hey, these are the projects we've worked on. Uh, we can see their work orders uh, by priority, their top five most uh, completed work order tasks and how many work orders by year, you know, they've completed. And we can see a, a density map here, a dot density map of, of where those work orders are happening. Uh, but the thing I do like to point out with this dashboard is again, it's, it's within a hub site. So we can uh, get these dashboards out. We can get them into the hands of the general public. Um, we can make them very accessible to them. So, Hey, we can convey what we're working on, what we're doing for you. Um, we can show them the dashboard and we can get that to them in a hub site. Up next, I'll go ahead and we'll take a quick look at the DC uh, Department of Transportation. And, and this dashboard actually comes to you in the form of, of a story map. So again, we can put these dashboards in a lot of cool places. We can do a lot with them uh, when we convey them to the general public. So here, again, they've got uh, kind of a, 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 tab, a tabular structure for their dashboard, like the, how they have it here set up in their story map. They're looking at an overview. They're giving us some uh, overview, you know, information of how they keep track of all of their pavement stuff. We can break it down again by asset. So if we wanted to um, open up the dashboard, they've got their their paving information broken up by roads, by sidewalks, by alleys and markings. Um, and I really like doing that, breaking it up by assets. If we want to have it all in one dashboard or, or all in one format, uh, I do like having those tabular um, setups in there. Just again, because we're not overwhelming. Uh, the end user with all this information and all these dashboard elements, we can break it up specifically to help um, kind of eliminate all that, you know, overwhelmingness of, of maybe if we have all these elements and all these uh, different features in our map, uh, this just kind of help avoids that and breaks it down specifically by asset. So we can see on their roads what they've got uh, for their setup in their dashboard. They can see the total number of completed paved miles, um, how many substantially completed miles they've got, which uh, pavements are, are under construction, and how many they, miles they have planned for their uh, pavements. We can even check that out if we go to the sidewalks tab, we can see that it updates based on uh, the sidewalks. So we can even select again from a list if we wanna know a little bit more about a specific sidewalk uh, that they've got going on, we can zoom to that and they can make it flash for us, make it stand out, this is the one we're talking about. They give us some information here in their list to help us kind of navigate this as well. We can see this is uh, the one that they're working on. It's just uh, you know, a tenth of a mile long. It's, it's under construction, so they're working on that one there. So the next one I'm going to go ahead and go to is uh, Maryland Department of Transportation. This is their Road Ready dashboard. Um, this one I, I like to show off because it's got some uh, some cool interactivity that I like to, to point out. So we can see, we can zoom in to, um, they've got a roads layer in here that shows us um, kind of where their construction is happening and how many projects they've completed in the last 60 days. Uh, we can see the projects by speed limit. We can see uh, the active projects by their jurisdictions, by their um, counties. And we can see when we select uh, from any of these elements, it's going to, again, filter some of the other elements that we have. So if we're just looking at Howard County, uh, they completed 20 in 2020, and there's 11 more projects uh, in progress. The next one we'll take a look at is Brampton uh, in Ontario. This is their road closures and re lane restrictions dashboard. And I like to show this one just because uh, it's a good example of how configurable, again, dashboards are. Uh, you can see this must be their city's color scheme, or I don't know why. It's, it's very kind of bold, again, with all these colors. It just shows you how much um, we can configure dashboards to convey, convey information uh, to the general public. So I, I do like to point out how much they actually have configured this one. They've gone into each one of these elements. You know, they've updated the color scheme uh, on every single one of these elements, and this must be something that must be universal to them, but this is a very uh, configured dashboard. Next, we can see uh, Michigan bridge conditions. And again, this uh, dashboard is coming to us in the form of a story map. Uh, they've got some, some overview information here for us. We can see all of their, their bridges and their structures throughout uh, Michigan here in their, their map. 
we wanted to know a little bit more about what they're doing, about how this stuff is uh, maintained and the conditions are applied, the ratings are applied. They gave us that helpful information here. Say we wanted to go ahead and look at some posted and closed bridges. Uh, they've got all that stuff outlined up, outlined for us here as well. And we can see when we select the, these tabs, uh, it's filtering data again in the actual map itself. So if we wanted to go ahead and look at some other dashboard stuff that they've got, this one is just chock full of helpful information and helpful charts, graphs, gauges for us that help convey some of the information here that they're wanting to get out to us. So again, they've got some filters for us up here. We can use to uh, even narrow our results as well as we look at our data and look at some of these bridge conditions. We can see that they've got 25% uh, you know, of their bridges in good. They've got 67% uh, you know, of them are in fair. All of their bridges here are broken down like that. So if I apply a filter, we can see that the poor, since I selected poor, it's gonna just show Hey, when I select this filter, this is how it interacts again with these other dashboard elements to convey our, our, convey our information to our end users. And finally, the last uh, dashboard I, I wanted to show off here is one that kind of shows the real time aspects of dashboards. Uh, so this is a snowplow monitoring dashboard. I think this is just using some example data, but uh, you can see what they have is they've got their snowplow monitoring set up real time so that we can track all the different trucks throughout, uh, you know, throughout our organizational area. Uh, so real time, we're conveying this to the public. Hey, here's where our snow plows are. Uh, here's the roads that are not plowed. We, these are the ones we have plowed and you can see our trucks are updating their location. Here's where our trucks are going to, you know, here's where they've been. Um, so we can see even the average is truck speed, the status of our streets we can see and uh, what kind of complaints here on the right side that have been submitted by uh, the general public, most likely in the form of a survey one, two, three form or in some other uh, uh, way, maybe citizen problem reporter, uh, but in some way that the public has entered these complaints um, and we can see that uh, some of the information breaking down here, we can see what the, the general complaint category is hey, we, we need our street plowed desperately. We're gonna submit that. Uh, their mail, some mailboxes have been hit. Uh, we can see those complaints even here on the map as well. And again, we're looking at another list, kind of breaking down uh, some of those lists uh, or some of those complaints more in detail here as well. So I can see, uh, again, my trucks are moving real time. So that's a key uh, uh, way to track some of our, our assets like this. Our, our assets also involve, again, people, uh, equipment, trucks, uh, more so than just the stationary hydrant, you know, just on the ground. Um, so again, this is something I, I, I just like to point out for that ability to have that, uh, that real-time data monitoring as well. So if somebody submits another complaint, we're going to see that complaint total jump up to 25. Uh, we're going to see our list expand. We're going to see our, our chart here expand as well. Even if I wanted to just break it down by truck, I could just select truck one. It's going to show me where truck one is and it'll focus just on truck one as he uh, goes through his his work orders his plowing uh, jurisdictions we can see his speed so uh, again that's just a, a, an example dashboard of that real-time data um, tracking so with that i think i'd like to turn it over see if there's any questions that anybody has regarding operations dashboard uh, nothing coming in yet, guys. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat box, um, or if you're comfortable, you can go ahead and ask those live. That was great, Mike. A lot of, a lot of really cool dashboards going, going through there, so that was great. And, uh, if you guys also, you can send them to uh, Mike directly through the chat room if we've gotten anything. But uh, still doing pretty good on time. We actually almost caught up a little bit. Uh, not seen any here. Well, that's all right, guys. Um, again, any questions you got, follow up with Mike directly. You can message him uh, directly through the chat room. Uh, Mike actually uh, had a few uh, questions come in um, in the in between after his presentation on Quick Capture. Mike, did you want to go ahead and share some of those with the group? Yeah, uh, I had a couple of good questions that came in. Um, one was about the accuracy of um, phones, um, and along with um, 
uh, collector, just like collector, you can add a high precision uh, device to your collector. Quick Capture does the same thing. So you can use the integrated GPS unit of your device, your phone or your iPad, your tablet. Um, but you can also then say, okay, hey, I'm connected to this other GPS unit, Bluetooth, or, um, you know, if that's a triple R2 or just, you know, bad elf GPS unit or whatever it is. So you can kind of narrow some of that accuracy down. So it's not 300 feet or, or 35 feet or whatever like that. So quick capture and collector and tracker and all the other things allow for, um, higher accuracy GPS units to be connected into it. That was one question. The other question was about um, linear uh, quick capture applications. So there is, you can do quick capture on, um, in one form, you can edit multiple layers. So uh, there is an example that was the, um, I think the one was the for love of for love for walking and cycling so that was there's an example of that in, in that's a template that you can actually look and see that you're editing linear points you're actually collecting linear um, data as you go uh, gps but as you're doing that you can also take pictures of issues along a point it's for finding problems in sidewalks or roads or whatever like that for walking and cycling but you can modify that to whatever your need might be so you can edit multiple layers in one particular project with quick capture. You can also do line um, line features too as well. So I just wanted to bring up those two things. Good questions. Awesome, great, perfect. I love how all this is just flowing together. So uh, speaking of flowing, next we have Matt. Uh, Matt looks like you're on there, perfect. So Matt's gonna go over migrating to electronic inspection forms it's gonna be our last presentation of the day so thank you uh to all of you that have stuck with us we really appreciate it um again uh, uh we really hope you guys have uh you know really going to take something away from this so we really appreciate it and appreciate the interaction as well so uh matt's going to wrap us up here and then when he's done um i'll just have a little bit of a wrap up for anybody so uh, matt go ahead take it away okay thanks bill <laughs> Share my screen. Yep. Looks good. Okay. So welcome to the final stop on today's showcase train. This is migrating to electronic inspection forms. So I know many of you in the public works sector are involved with asset inspections. What can be done to improve the workflow or to make things more efficient? What can flip the switch to go from paper-based forms to electronic forms? If that light bulb is now glowing, here's how we can go from paper to digital. It starts out with getting everybody on the same page and having a detailed plan. Once you organize your records, you can choose how to collect the data electronically. Finally, you manage your data and use the information to make data-driven decisions. Today, we will further dive into each of these steps and provide a demonstration of the software used for electronic inspection forms. So at the beginning of the project, you want to get everybody on the same team, the A-team. When you determine who in your department or organization should be involved and you assemble the team, you may ask a few questions. What do you want to get from the data? When to repair or replace the asset? What are the costs involved? And how many, how many people need to be involved? How many, how many devices, how many resources? So the next step is to have a plan. And everybody loves when a plan comes together. Make decisions on what you want to collect, how to set up the form, and how you plan to use the data. What roles will the members of your team play? Have a timeline for the project and get your team trained on the process. 
there will be change and that might be easier for some and more difficult for others, but it's important to invest in training. So moving on to organizing your existing records. If you have GIS staff, involve them early in this process. In fact, you may want to include them when you put your A team together. Determine how you're going to use the content of your paper forms when you build your electronic forms. Consider industry standards for inspections. For the existing records, do you need assistance from a document scanning company to convert these records to digital form or can you cover that task? So here's a, a paper form that you may be familiar with, uh, something like this. It's kind of hard to read. It could be at the mercy of the inspector's handwriting. So you have stacks and stacks of these paper records. Some you cannot de decipher the handwriting and maybe some records got destroyed in a, in a flood or a fire or a tornado or some, some type of disaster. How do we get an improved, more efficient method for inspection forms? And the survey says it's ArcGIS Survey 123. And as you can see, this table will compare the functionality between Survey 123 and Collector. Collector, of course, is map centric, Survey 123 is form centric, but it has geolocation capabilities. Survey 123 can be used with other ArcGIS apps as we've talked about today. Collector, Workforce, um, we've seen them embedded in dashboards and hub sites. I'm going to show an example of cross-platform functionality with Collector later on in this presentation. So there are a few ways in which you can utilize Survey 123. One is via the Survey123 website or the web designer. You can also download the Survey123 Connect desktop app. And there's also the Survey123 mobile app. So with the Survey123 website, it gives you the ability to create some pretty simple forms. With Survey123 Connect, you can create more complex forms that involve logical expressions, calculations, nested questions based on certain responses, among other options. These forms are built into a formatted Excel spreadsheet. And later on, we will take a tour of the Survey123 Connect app and the XLS form. Another important aspect of using either Connect or the Survey123 website is that to your ArcGIS online organization. You can use the same user login and password. Each Survey123 form is connected to a feature service that's stored in your AGO content. And this is where the form responses, once they're submitted, Will, will be stored within that feature layer. So you've you planned the content of your inspection form. You've collected the data. What is next? So you can now use that collected information to make data-driven decisions. Which assets need to be repaired or replaced now versus which are in satisfactory condition? What will the cost be? And with your connection to the ArcGIS online organization, you have the ability to share and collaborate via web maps, web apps, and dashboards as we've talked about this morning. So you can share that with, with anyone within your organization or within certain groups. Okay, Bill, now is time for the poll question. Okay, give me one second. All right. Okay. 
couple answers. There we go. Oh. Okay. A lot of paper records still. Give another couple of seconds here. Yep. So most people responding. We'll share those. A lot of paper. Yes, a lot of paper. A lot of need. Uh, a lot of need for conversion to digital. Okay. All right. I'm going to jump into um, the demonstration portion of this presentation, and uh, we'll start out by taking a look behind the curtain of Survey One Two Three Connect and the XLS form. So we have um, up here on the screen, we have Survey123 Connect app. So we are logged in. Notice we're logged in with our ArcGIS online uh, user and into our organization. Um, in the My Survey Designs section, list any of the surveys that, uh, that I have, have created. Um, our tutorial section. Um, this is a variety of survey one, two, three topics, uh, links to, to instructional videos, how to's. Um, so any, any questions you may have when, when you are creating your survey form, um, you can access these, uh, these instructional videos and, uh, to get, to get more information about those, uh, those topics. The community tab, this is where you can uh, find any questions or discussions from other users, read blogs from Esri or social media postings. Um, so it's, it's uh, tied into the GeoNet community. Um, so this is a good resource to have if you, uh, if you have any other questions. So I'm gonna go back to my survey designs and I'm gonna click on my culvert inspection form. So this will preview what the survey will look like and you can choose on what type of device or monitor. Um, so we're looking at a tablet portrait right now. We can go to a smartphone, um, we can do a monitor. So it's, there's a variety of different uh, previews that you can you can take a look at to see how how that's going to look. Uh, the next section to look at here is the schema preview. It's going to show you what um, how, how your data is set up, how the feature service is set up with field names, field types, and uh, and things like that. And then you have a section for other settings. Um, you can provide a summary and description. You can provide a certain style to your survey, changing background colors and, and text and things like that. Um, you can also have, uh, you can show link content. Um, you can choose your base map and, and different uh, zoom levels. There's also a section um, you can enable some other things such as an inbox. Um, uh, for one client, I, uh, I set up an inbox for a, a water department cross connection survey. And when the data collector would, would go out, he'd have his list um, from that inbox of which, which addresses uh, still needed to have the survey done. And then once the survey is submitted, that that uh, record or that feature will disappear from that list, from that inbox list, or there's also a map view for that. Um, so that that is something that can be enabled as well. Uh, the next thing I'd like to do is take a look at the XLS form. So this is where the survey is built and it's and where it's configured. Um, the, the type column is what is associated with, with your survey questions. Um, so you have, have your different survey questions, uh, what you want to, uh, the information that you want to find out. 
the name column is what is associated in the feature service, the, the field name in the feature service. You can also give, um, give those, those attributes a, a different name for, for labeling in your survey. And there are, are a variety of other things that you can do. You can provide a hint, um, a, a line of text to, to instruct the user what to do. Um, you can constrain values and, and provide a message. Um, certain fields could be required and you can mark that as such. Um, you can change the appearance of certain questions if you wanted to do a drop down list or list them all out uh, vertically or horizontally. Uh, there's, there's different options for, for, uh, for providing those questions. You can provide default values. You can um, enter in relevant expressions to say if, if an answer is yes, then we want to list, uh, we want to show this other question and, and what responses uh, are possible with that question. Um, you can perform calculations with, with certain, um, with, with, with data. So there's a lot of configuration that can go on here in the Excel form when you're creating your survey. And that's, that's just the first tab, uh, the survey tab. There's also a choices tab, which will list um, uh, your choices for drop-down lists. Um, they're associated with the, the attributes in the feature service. The settings tab uh, shows you what uh, the, the uh, ArcGIS uh, feature service ID uh, what, what the responses of your survey, wh where that's going to be submitted to, um, and also which, which, um, which form or which, which uh, part of that feature service is going to be um, involved in that submission process. So in this case, for our culvert inspection form, we're going to submit the responses to the inspection record uh, table. There's also a types tab, uh, an informational reference uh, for if you have any, you know, again, if you have any questions, you can consult this tab uh, to get some in more information about building your survey. Okay. Our next step, uh, we're going to run through an inspection workflow. And we will start out uh, we're going to start out with a collector map. So we're going to go into our collector map for culvert inspections. And our map has the location of, of some culverts. And what we're going to do, we're going to collect new, we're going to, um, I'm sorry, we're going to uh, click on an existing culvert. Let me get out of this process. Okay, we're gonna click on an existing culvert. Choose that in the list. And we have some information here about our culvert. What we wanna do now is add an inspection record. So I'm gonna click on that. And we are going to open up survey one, two, three. Um, this'll, be, this'll be a mobile, this is the mobile app, also available on Windows. So our, our survey one, two, three inspection form opens. And we're going to, uh, it's going to default to today's date as well as the inspector. Um, we'll give it a structural rating. Opening rating and a scour rating. And once, um, once I enter in these ratings, the condition is going to, is going to be tied to the, the condition is, is tied to that number rating and will automatically update in the survey form. So we have a poor rating here, poor rating here uh, for scour rating. If I go down, I'm going to click on comments and I'm going to come back up. Poor rating. The overall rating now is poor. Is there maintenance action required? Yes. So we are going to click on, we're going to clean it. Um, you can enter in comments. You can add a, a photo or no, another type of attachment here if you need to. I'm going to uh, submit this survey now. We will send now. 
So that survey has been submitted. That data is now stored in that feature service in your ArcGIS online organization. And our next step, our next stop on this tour will be the ArcGIS Survey123 website. So I'm gonna refresh this page. And we'll do, just do a quick tour here of uh, the Survey123 website. It looks uh, similar to the the content in Survey123 Connect as far as what surveys are available in my surveys. So I'm gonna click into our culvert inspection survey. Your first tab is showing an overview of, of, this, uh, the, of the survey form. So 13 responses, um, the first submitted on, last submitted on. Um, that's good. It's going to give you a high level view of, of, of your survey uh, data. The next tab is the design. So we've already designed the survey in survey one, two, three connect, but if you wanted to design a more simple survey, um, you can go right into this website, go to the design tab and design your survey here. So um, you can, you can enter in different types of questions here. You can change the appearance, um, change colors, add background images and themes and things like that. Uh, but we already have our survey. Um, one thing I also will mention here with, with the, our survey one, two, three connect, um, our survey was created in connect. So it cannot be modified here in this web designer. It has to be modified back in the connect app. The next tab is the collaborate tab. It gives you some options for how you can share the survey, how it can be opened, um, who can submit to it, uh, things like that. Can there be multiple submissions from the same, from the same user? Um, the next tab is analyze. Um, so this provides you with some charts and graphics displaying characteristics of the data that you've collected in your survey. Um, I'll scroll down to a couple here. Gives you a structural rating, uh, structural condition. So we have, we're looking at five that are in, in poor condition. Um, so it gives you some insights for your data um, and that can help you make, determine what, what to do next, what decisions you're gonna make. Okay. So the, the final part of, of the demonstration I wanna to go to, we're gonna go into ArcGIS Online, go into our web map. Um, so this is a similar, it's, it's a copy of the web map that we had looked at before in the collector app. And so we're showing our uh, culvert locations. Um, we have our, our culverts feature layer along with the inspection record table. Um, a couple of things that I have created here are, are join layers with between the feature layer and the table. And this is going to show us a few different aspects of, of the data. The first one is a layer showing months from the last inspection. So I'm going to turn that on. And each of these symbols, so, so the symbols that are larger, um, have had a longer period of time since the last inspection. So, so in this case, this has been a few years since it's been inspected, I believe. Um, our last inspection was September of 2018. Um, so the, the larger, so you can set this up, the larger the icon, the longer amount of time in between inspections. If it's a more recent inspection, that icon is gonna be smaller. And another layer that we can do in this, a similar fashion is with the condition. So this shows the condition. I'll expand the, uh, the layer here to show uh, what those different uh, condition ratings are. And we can see we have a, a critical situation here uh, that we, we need to take care of. Uh, so 
you can you can display your data um, in, in these ways in the web map um, to show what needs what needs your attention what which features which assets need your attention uh, based on condition or some other some other attribute um, from this web map and we've talked about this already you can then create some web apps um, you can create dashboards you can pull pull out it pull all that information in and then um, get that to the people that, that are the decision makers uh, let them see the data see what's going on and then then make decisions from there so that is all i have today um, are there any questions Yep, uh, we got one in here right now, Matt. Um, and guys, if you have anything for Matt, go ahead and drop those in the chat box um, or you can message him directly. Um, oh, got another one pop in, but let's see. First one here, uh, can the survey system handle uploading a picture with every survey form? Um, yes, I believe so. I think I think you can adjust the size of, your, of the image that it's gonna save. Um, but I, I don't know what, what the upper limit is of, okay, if, if there's, is there, is it a million photos? Is there, is it 10,000? I, I don't know the upper limit to that, but, um, each asset can have, can have multiple attachments. Okay. Uh, let's see another one here. Is there a way to have a work order generated automatically after the inspection is complete? Um, there is there is some automation that can be done through the Survey One Two Three Connect app, and I um, I did not touch on that, but it involves um, actually it's through the website. Um, under settings, there is a webhooks section. So you can add a webhook to trigger certain certain things. I, I know it can be set up to to for email notifications and things like that. Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure on the work order, but I think with with the way that this could, I think it probably could be set up to trigger an action. Um, from from a survey response. Perfect. Uh, let's see. That is in. That's it right now. So, um, guys, we'll go ahead and close out. Matt, I'm gonna share over you a little contact information for everybody. So. Everybody, everybody that stuck with us, thank you. Thank you very, very much. We wouldn't be able to do this uh, without you guys, without your uh, response to this, without you guys signing up and your interest in this. We appreciate all of you for sticking around. Um, it, uh, it went pretty quickly. We're obviously a little bit ahead of schedule, so that's nice. Everybody get some food. Um, but uh, that was uh, a good four hours. I hope you guys really got something out of that. Um, like I said before, I'll be following up. Keep your eyes open. I'll be following up with a survey. We'd just like a little feedback just in terms of how we did. Um, we do plan on doing uh, probably another one in the spring, I would imagine, uh, like we did last uh, back in May, um, especially um, with restrictions on still meeting in person, probably still going to be in place for a while. Um, so, so keep your eyes out. Look into maybe do another one in the spring, maybe a different topic, switching it up. Um, but uh, obviously, in the meantime, you guys visit cloudpointgeo.com for anything you need. Um, we've got all of our emails up there. Uh, I threw Mitch's back up there as well. So he's he's always more than happy to answer any questions you guys have um, and get, uh, get in touch with any of our presenters if it's something just in general or specific to what they talked about. Um, and you can get in touch with me. I don't know why you'd want to, but go ahead. You can email me. Phone number here at the office, of course, 877-377-8124. Um, always ready and willing to talk to you guys. And we're all over social media, so you can follow us there for tips, tricks, videos. Um, YouTube especially is a good one. Uh, a lot of good people signing up and subscribe there for YouTube uh, tutorials and clips that we like to put up as well. So um, again, uh, I will be, this was recorded, so uh, we'll be looking at uh, getting that to you guys. I don't know if it'll have to just be um, 
a shared file or uh, maybe we'll split it up into each presentation, um, something like that. But uh, probably sometime next week, uh, check your inboxes for that as well. Um, but again, just want to say thank you presenters. Uh, thank you guys for, for joining in. Kevin, thanks for the shout out there. Um, but uh, again, thank you guys all for attending. I'll leave this up for a minute and uh, we'll hopefully talk and see you guys soon. Close it out with a little more Jimmy. Bye, everybody.